recording now and everybody should be entering. Okay, so let's wait a few minutes for everyone to join. Good morning, everyone. Now we're back to the usual summer weather in California. No more uh, tropical storms hitting. No. Did you get any damage where you are? Not in Pasadena. No, I mean, we got we got about six inches of rain in in one day, but that's within the range of we had more than that a few times last week, uh, March, I think. My wife works in the Coachella Valley, and it definitely took out some roads and bridges and yeah coachella valley and uh, the north side of the san bernardino mountains got really hit badly i think the north side of the san bernardino mountains got 10 inches or 25 centimeters of rain in 24 hours nuts that's a lot of water but and they don't normally get the the rain on that side of the mountains. We always get it here in Pasadena because the with the atmospheric rivers just hit the mountains and dump on us on the south side of the mountains. But the north side is what got hit this time because the water was wrapping around uh, with the tropical storm circulation. There was a plane that uh, was landing in Orange County that. Uh, during the the tropical storm and with strong winds and uh, it was a 737 from Alaska Airlines that um, the landing gear failed on the on landing and they meant the pilots managed to land the plane and pull it off the, the runway with no I mean the dent the planes probably totaled because the landing gear punched through the wing and <laughs> but they were able to uh, to pull off the onto the taxiway and they did a normal exit on the uh, stairs and uh, pilots did a great job with what was possible on the airplane. Don't tell us did, stories like this. <laughs> did they break the landing gear or did the landing gear break by itself? I think they landed really hard. Yeah, they landed hard, but the, apparently that 737-800 model always lands hard, especially if for the Orange County Airport has a very short runway. <laughs> we call that John Wayne Airport. I don't know. There's obviously investigation. John Wayne Airport, yes. <laughs> it's and it's uh, between two freeways, so they can't extend the runway. That's what we do at Alaska Airlines. Crappy planes, good pilots. No, the planes are actually quite good too, usually. Yeah, maybe beer. Just there's that beer. Too many hard landing. <laughs> All right, we're almost up to sixty people on the call. Keep them coming. Yeah, we'll give them a few more minutes. I'm gonna refill my coffee. Few more minutes. Some people logged in from India. There, it's not good morning for them. It's like after midnight or almost midnight. Yeah. I think Last we... year we had people in uh, like fifteen different time zones or something. It's not some huge number. We should include that in our post course survey. <laughs> <laughs> let's see still 60 60 is a good number shall we uh shall we get going sure good morning everyone or the afternoon or evening depending on your um your time zone um welcome to day three of the ice plus short course um, I'll just briefly go over what we have in store for you today. Let's 
So day three is Wednesday. Um, we will have a review uh, of of anything arising from yesterday. If anyone wants to show their results, please do. Uh, if people want to go over problems that they encountered, please please raise those problems and we will talk about them. Um, at 11, uh, I will lead a session on uh, preparing and using inside data for modeling. Um, this will include um, how you downsample data, some considerations of, of forward modeling with the ACADA uh, routines, um, calculating lines of sight, and how you, uh, an example of running uh, an optimized model um, where we, there isn't a linear solution, but we can find a, a nonlinear solution. Um, at 12 uh, Pacific time, we'll have we'll be joined by Haresh Fatahi, one of the developers of ICE, and he will talk about time series theory. He's also one of the developers of MintPy, um, which is the, the software we'll be using on Friday to actually produce time series from INSA. And then finally, um, Sim Sanger will join us and talk about making interferogram stacks for our, using the ARIA tools. ARIA tools is a set of, of routines that um, that can access an archive of pre-processed interferograms and download them to your machine and mosaic them and, and stitch them together and all the, all the good stuff. Um, and we use those ARIA standard product interferograms uh, in our time series analysis later in the course. So this is showing you how to how to basically download those things and and prepare them for time series analysis. Any questions about that? Yeah, listen to the ARIA tool stuff. That that's getting more and more relevant because there's now actually millions of ARIA uh, interferograms available over many sites, um, especially many geophysical interesting sites. So if you look for the through the ASF archive, uh, you will find many of those, um, and, and and sort of using knowing how to use ARIA tools to get those into time series analysis is going to be useful. Yeah, there's half a million over Tibet. Yep, which is a lot, and they are much, much, much smaller files than the SLC files. You know, those take those are four point three gigabytes or thereabouts, whereas yeah. a standard product interferogram is more like sixty megabytes. Yes, 60 megabytes. Yeah, and you saw yesterday and the day before how painful it is to actually get to an interferogram computationally. And uh, ARIA tools takes all of that complication away from you and lets you actually do the science. The The great thing, though, is that ARIA actually is ICE, but <laughs> deployed yes. on supercomputers. Plus, the, uh, the ARIA Gun W format is very similar to what we're going to be using for NISAR uh, next year. So it's excellent practice. And GDAL compatible. Okay. So people, do, does anyone have anything they'd like to show? Or does anyone have a question you'd like help answering? Daniel. Good one to everyone. Um, I was able to produce interferograms and I was aiming for the uh, Ridgecrest uh, 2019 earthquake. And I found something that is rather peculiar in terms of the uh, targeting, if I may share my screen. Of course. Okay. Uh, share. Okay. So let me, uh, before I do that, so here's the, the box area. I created Google Earth. I exported the KML then went to uh, ASF Vertex and got the track, uh, the tracks, the product numbers and imported here. And uh, this is what I'm getting. And it took me a while, but staring at it, this feature here is a lake. Yeah, and it is near Lake Isabel in the indeed. Sierra Nevada. Indeed, it's right here. So even yeah. though I I put the, uh, the, the, uh, coordinates for the area of interest following these corners. Yeah, so I think what, you, what happened is you only processed one subswath of the scene. And okay. You, so this, that subswath covers the port to the west. You but it intersects uh, with your area of interest. <laughs> yeah. A little bit here. There, there, there's yeah. a, a little smidge of the, uh, west, the western edge of the box. Yeah. Topo up XML, you can change the swath you want to process. 
Yeah, so in the in the in the uh, XML file for the example, we were only processing one subswath, the subswath three. Yes. Uh, but in this case, you need to do, to process subswaths one and two as well. Okay, understood. Or instead, because or instead, yeah. You're not yeah, really saying anything in subswath three for this this earthquake is all in subswath two. two. There's no Got earthquake. It. There's no earthquake fringes in there, or at least not any anything substantial. Yeah, the fairground though. Otherwise, it's it's a beautiful place to do in so. <laughs> uh, in the summer. In the summer. <laughs> yeah, I okay. mean this is southern Sierra Nevada is completely covered with snow, especially this year. I can tell you it's more it's it's more comfortable doing inside there than GPS. <laughs> Especially in the summer. Okay. So I will uh change the uh, process the pipeline to do uh, uh yes. the, the second swath or the first swath. Or well, one and two. So the way that you do it is one and two. You can set, you could put a comma separated list in the in the square brackets. You could actually open it up and and look at it maybe. Well, which which XML you're talking about? Top's top, app XML. Yeah, top sap. Yeah, top sap. Okay. Uh, secondary three. Yeah, so do do one comma two instead, and and then you'll get copy. Thank you. Just remember to save that XML. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that given that it is me, that's very good advice. So <laughs> thank you. So Benjamin says he got an error for all swaths except for number one. Um I I'd be surprised you don't get data that doesn't have all three subswaths um in the in the SLC file. So um saying if it if his AOI did only overlap number one. Maybe that's the issue, yeah. I wonder if that is an issue. Do we have any do you know, Eric? I don't know which scene he's he's processing. <laughs> but one thing you can always do is is just to comment out the line that sets the AOI. Hmm. And then you'll get it to process if if it doesn't. Um, well, you'll get it to process, and if it does, if there's no overlap, then it means your your SLCs don't overlap. I saw a hand up, yes. Alejandra. Um, yeah. Um, I, if I may, I can share my results. Please. Um. Let me try this Okay. So now I think you can see Ooh. my yes, we do. Oh, nice so, so for this exercise, I wanted to explore the uh, the large dike intrusion that occurred on Mount Etna in December 24, 2018. I think you found and... it. <laughs> And it looks pretty well, actually. The processing with the notebook worked pretty well. And it was possible to, to generate this co event uh, interferogram, which, uh, yeah, as you can see, is characterized by uh, a kind of dipole structure or, uh, yeah. And one dipole here, I will show the, okay, no. Uh, this is not, this here is not a uh, geocoding, uh, geocoded, but uh, here, no, no, sorry, uh, here, ah. here, we have the um, ungraped uh, interprogram uh, filter, and what we can see is uh, that there is uh, that the this kind of dipole structure um it's characterized by this this slope 
uh, showing a positive range change in the radar in on the east uh, side of the volcano on the on the eastern flank of the volcano and a negative um sorry on the on the other side a mm -hmm. positive uh, positive values on the western flank of the volcano and uh, negative values on the eastern part then i try to plot uh, the interprogram on a base map and try to convert the phase information into uh, displacement and that was something that i asked following your suggestion gareth uh, from yesterday uh, in order to convert the file, the the the, the, the engraved uh, file, using the um, the equation to convert, considering the wave line wave uh, length of the uh, sentinel, and then we get a displacement of more or less of approximately uh, three uh, thirty centimeters on the eastern part of the volcano. Uh, yeah, and more or less 25 centimeters on the western flank of the volcano. Depicting, uh, yeah, the, the, the dike intrusion. At the core of this event. Yes, that looks good. It's brilliant. Yeah, very cool. So, uh, but uh, what, I, what I'm missing is the ionospheric correction. Uh, I'm not pretty sure if with this. I think just you analyzing the interferogram, we can, what we can say about some uh, ionospheric uh, contributions. I, I, that, that is something that I, I consider interesting to discuss, like, just with a uh, simple observation of the interprogram, could we just like to consider if it's necessary the um, correction, the genospheric correction, or or not? Yeah, in this case, the uh, you don't see a, a a large ramp over the whole scene, exactly, and uh, that then that you could conclude that there's no significant ionosphere. In this pair, yeah. Yeah. for for Sentinel One, because it's C band, the the ionosphere is much uh, less significant. It uh, and the ionosphere also uh, depends with time. Uh, the ionosphere gets much more uh, actively changing during the times when the uh, the sun is uh, more in the active part of the solar cycle. So. Mm -hmm. For uh, Sentinel One scenes in 2015 and, and 2016, you may see more ionosphere, but 2018 is uh, in the in the low part of the ionospheric cycle of the solar cycle. So uh, okay. there's very little ionosphere ge in general for 2018 uh, and uh, uh, 2018, 20, 2017, 2018, 20, all the way through 2022. Uh, we're starting to move back into the uh, more active part of the ionosphere uh, of the solar cycle uh, this year. So uh, we may start getting more ionosphere in uh, uh, the Sentinel-1 data and the uh, NISAR data next year. Yeah, so you it's it's an aerosource that you have your data, right? And there's probably some ionosphere in it, but it's it's not the primary nor the secondary uh, source of information. You do see a little bit, if you look sort of on the north um, east of your scene, you see some phase that seems to track topography. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, you have some residual topographic, uh, tropospheric errors in there, some stratified uh, tropospheric delays uh, that probably maybe an error, uh, sort of an atmospheric model might help with. Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow, I think. Um mm -hmm. So that would be the first thing to remove. 
Um, and and Ionosphere, if there's any left, uh, would be uh, at the very best secondary, probably even drowned out by coherence issues in this in this particular area. Yeah, that is, that that's something that actually that uh, I I had uh, like a kind of question. This correlation with the topography, mm -hmm. which uh, if I understand, I, I understand, I understood well. Uh, these kind of uh, errors, we we could deal with that with the time with a time series processing. No? This kind of correlation between topography and tropos tropospheric uh, contribution? Actually, for the so there's two types of, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow, there's two types of atmospheric uh, issues that you see in interferograms. One of them we call uh, stratified delay. That's the one that that's sort of a phase delay that correlates with topography and is caused by uh, you know atmospheric stratification and differences in atmospheric stratification. That one is better treated uh, with atmospheric models. Um, it's not necessarily a statistical effect in a sense that it's not necessarily zero mean in a time series, uh, and it's not spatially following the statistical um, properties that we usually assign with the other component of atmosphere, which is turbulence. So we have turbulence delay, turbulent delay that looks a little bit more like the wobbly stuff that you're seeing in other parts of the interferogram could be more a turbulent delay. That one is treatable using filtering approaches in time series analysis, because that one is typically zero mean uh, and and sort of temporarily uncorrelated. So, so with some temporal averaging, you can remove that effect much more effectively. The component that relates to topography is not necessarily zero mean and not, not necessarily temporarily uncorrelated. So there it helps to do first um, some mit mitigation using uh, atmospheric models. And there's some talk about this tomorrow. And then also on Friday, when Yunjun uh, walks you through um, MinPy, an inside time series analysis tool, it actually pulls atmospheric delay information from a weather model to try to remove most of those um, topography related errors. So you usually do that first, and then you do the time series analysis. OK. OK. OK, thank you. Yeah, all of these error sources you hear more about tomorrow. OK. So I stop uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, beautiful. Maybe something you can model with the tools that go. Yeah, I wanted to, to model it to try it. We do have a version of the modeling notebooks that does dike opening. Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> it's it's perfect. Okay. We also, um, when we removed the ionosphere from the uh, Hawaii interferogram we processed on Monday, you can also model that. Okay, it sounds great. Okay. And Amrit, thanks for sharing the link to the, the top split um, repository. Kind of a neat uh, thing to look at. So there's another question in the chat about the ionosphere. Um, in the Himalayan areas, ionospheric areas might be significant, or or uh, or could there be some other error source for Sentinel One? Um, looking at the Josh in math uh, land subsidence, there were significant random errors, and he wasn't sure they weren't sure what caused them. Um, well, the Himalayas are close to the magnetic equator, I guess. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, the magnetic equator goes uh, quite a bit further north in the uh, towards the Himalayas and and uh, eastern part of Eurasia. So, uh, yeah, the, the ionosphere is stronger in the Himalayas than in other and other places that are low latitudes. I've generally seen the worst ionosphere, though, again, in, in um, ALOS data, not so much in um, Sentinel-1. I mean, it, yeah. as, as Franz was saying, it's likely to be there, but whether it's yeah. the most significant noise source. So if you are off about 10, plus minus 10 degrees of the the geomagnetic equator, 
the ionosphere during the daytime has actually a fairly significant slope. Uh, you get sort of um, a blob in the middle where the sun is, and then there are ramps left and right of it. As sort of the TC, the total electron content drops down there. And what happens um, in the daytime, if you form interferograms from daytime acquisition of, uh, of Sentinel-1, the way the slope looks may change, may be different from one day to the next. And you can actually get quite significant phase ramps uh, uh, in these areas, not necessarily as much smaller scale uh, um, patterns, but you get very strong ramps uh, that people have observed. And those come from basically the, the intensity of TEC in the center being slightly different from one day to the next. And that causes the gradient of the ionosphere to sort of be different on the sides of this a big sort of ionospheric peak feature. And so those have been observed in that region off and on where you have uh, several fringes across your swath um, um, that can occur. Um, there's also- The troposphere, the troposphere yeah. would be very strong in the Himalayas because of the huge topographic relief and then big uh, water vapor. Yeah, if, if you see large scale ramps, that's likely ionosphere. If you see smaller scale, uh, patterns, they are most likely troposphere, especially, again, if they follow uh, topography. Um, um, I know Amrit has worked on the Himalayas a lot, and he has seen uh, quite significant stratified delays in the Himalayas, where you have very steep topography and a lot of microclimate. Uh, it's very difficult to remove. And that might look like a long wavelength signal, too, especially if you're sort of heading from the lowlands into Tibet. But there's a, <laughs> there's a static shift of topography of like a few thousand meters overall yeah there's a recent paper is that by um, um i think it's the paper out by um mark simons who's looked at um the tectonic motion in sort of the uh the himalayas in the surrounding areas pakistan etc it was in pakistan yeah yeah ollie stevenson um, right yeah, and he shows that there is significant ionospheric distortions that need to be considered to get sort of the interseismic slip there and interseismic deformation, right? It's one but of those things. Is, you're, the troposphere is probably the biggest source of error for a C-band. In the, in the long run, we're just going to correct everything, but... Plus, you have low coherence. It's really a difficult place. For INSAR. But in the end, maybe it's worth saying that the the relevance of being very careful with removing these error signals depends a little bit in the end always about uh, on the signal to noise. Uh, what is the size of the displacement you want to measure uh, relative to uh, the error sources? Um, so you can be a little more a bit more sloppy, I would say, with some of the corrections, if your deformation signal is very large. Um, also, it, if it, you're looking at something that's like a landslide that's only over a few kilometers area, then the, these yeah. long wavelength errors won't, won't have a, a significant effect on the local deformation. Yeah, so the impact uh, an error signal will have on your either the displacement you're measuring or the modeling parameters you estimate is, is going to be a little bit of a factor of the signal to noise. How large is the deformation signal relative to the noise? All right, Mohammed has his hand up. Uh, hello, can hello? you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have processed the loss to data uh, we have discussed in the uh, in the evening hours. Uh, I want to show some results in which I have applied uh, ionospheric corrections and without ionospheric corrections, but but still there are a lot of noise. Uh, to Go be ahead, share. That sounds interesting. May I share my screen? Go for it. So you he used the uh, ALOS two app, which is for processing ALOS two scans our data. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very cool. So in, in this, uh, we use LOS2 for the 
two uh, images. One is required for uh, 11 2021 and the second one was 23-10-2021. So this, this is the phase, uh, but there is no ionospheric correction is applied uh, in this image. And uh, I will also show some other results. Uh, like this one is the unwrapped uh, of the same image uh, without uh, any application of ionospheric corrections. Uh, the region is in at the eastern boundary of Indian and Eurasian plate collision. This is somewhere near the boundary of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And they pass through um, a big fault which is known as Chaman fault. Mm -hmm. Uh, th these are the interferograms uh, I obtained after the application of ionospheric. So there is a big change, but still we have a noise here in this region and also this region. And this noise is correlated with the topography. Topography is also behaving in the same way as the uh, noise is, is like in this in this way. And also there are some high hills and this is also on the mountain, mountainous region. And this is application of filter, which is improved a little bit, but this noise is still uh, there. Yep. And this is the unwrapped in which the, the same with the, with the ionospheric correction. And this is a uh, noise, which is, I, I don't know which is, due to uh, tropospheric uh, or maybe due to but it correlates with the topography yes beautiful uh, i may show the xml file i used maybe it's there yeah this one like uh, i i use the same parameter uh, like the default one but just uncommented this one like kinospheric uh, applications now i'm also uh, because we discussed in the in the uh, morning hours and then now i am I, I i run it and still it's running by changing these number of loops range loops and uh, azimuth loops two and one but i did not yes. get that it'll, it'll take much longer to run it might take several hours to complete yeah it's uh, i think around two hours are <laughs> Uh, it's, it's still running. Yeah, but it looks gorgeous, uh, and and it it makes sense. So the the stratified atmospheric delay is probably what's left. Yeah. Uh, who's going to talk about this tomorrow? Is, is it you, Eric? Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about the troposphere and the ionosphere uh, delays tomorrow. Although it's a short session, so I don't have a lot of time to. Do you find that stuff yeah. like Pi apps or what are you uh, or or radar or something or? Uh no, we uh I'm not gonna go into that. Okay. We don't have time to go through the tropospheric correction part. Uh, the primarily going to talk about how to do the ionosphere correction with strip map app. It does. It's very similar to the ionosphere correction that's done in um, ALOS two app. So they're they're both doing a split spectrum. Uh, calculation. Uh, we'll talk about how that works. Uh, I try to uncommit the split spectrum, but it gives me error. Uh, it doesn't go through like. Uh, yeah, split spectrum I, is what's used. Is the name for um, strip map app. The the properties are a little bit different for ALOS two app. They're they're almost the same, but slightly different. They were written by different people. <laughs> Uh, so it's not exact. You can't just mix and match the the input files for strip map app and ALOS two app. I mean, uh, I, I, but I tried with this uncommit and it was not running. It was yeah because that. that's that's uh, not not the right syntax for ALOS two app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the uh, the one that you have uh, running is is doing the same thing in principle. Um, so you're doing the right thing here. The, you just can't use the uh, split spectrum feature within with ALOS two. It is doing the split spectrum feature. It's just uh, that it's uh, has a different name. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, 
And may I know that there are a few comments down here, but I don't know how uh, what they are doing exactly like uh, like this that because there I see there are some features of also topography in the in the deformation where the earthquake is. Uh, I I was wondering that what does it mean by S I M? Uh, that's the. Uh, uh... The ALOS 2 app does some extra calculations to match the uh, the radar image to the DEM in case there's a large um, ionospheric uh, shift in the, in the geocoding. Um, normally, you shouldn't have to change that. It, it, so it does a it takes the DEM and it makes a simulated radar image. So it matches the actual radar image to the simulated radar image, and that. Um, to, to see if there's any residual shift that's due to the ionosphere um, uh, causing a, a large uh, range uh, displacement. Um, but normally uh, this this part of it doesn't need to be modified. Mm -hmm. so that's an extra calculation that's not done in strip map. Adam. Maybe, like uh, you know, somebody online, like uh, I know, uh, Amrit, you've done uh, Gakos uh, to do um, to get the atmospheric delay map. Uh, maybe you can slack uh, Muhammad and point him mm -hmm. the right direction. Uh, we'll yeah, sure, I can us. do that. Yeah, yeah, and on Thursday, on Friday, we'll look into MinPy, which which also uses um, a feature to uh, to get that delay component that you're worried about, uh, topographic related delay uh, out of the interferograms. Yes, when you're looking at a relatively small earthquake, like this is was a, like a 5.8, I think, if I remember. Yeah, right. yeah, it's 5.9. Yeah, um, so um, to see those earthquakes that are smaller than magnitude 6, sometimes you need to do a time series analysis to extract out the, the earthquake signal from the, the tropospheric delay. In fact, um, one of the, my colleagues, uh, uh, it was a a postdoc working with me also pro processed the Sentinel-1 data for this earthquake, and we found that we had to do a, a time series analysis to better separate the earthquake signal from the uh, tropospheric delays. I had a study from a few years ago where we looked at every earthquake that occurred on land within certain parameters, you know, certain depth ranges, certain magnitudes, and there were about a third of the earthquakes were very hard to spot without we didn't apply any type of uh, atmospheric correction just to see what you could see. Um, yeah, there was a a substantial number that you just they were just captured in captured in an interferogram that had lots of atmospheric blobs, like turbulence or something like that that just could, wouldn't go away. So yeah, it's tricky to study earthquakes less than magnitude six. Yeah, but it was quite visible in Sentinel one that uh, we have like uh, around sixty five centi uh, sixty five millimeter of deformation, which was with like three or four interferograms, and but this when with when the allows we have only one inter uh, one or two interferogram, which is also not visible very well due to some atmospheric noises. Uh, like for the for the time series with LOS, it's I think it's very tricky. We need a lot of space. Like uh, for these two images, it was around uh, sixty or seventy gigabytes. For the oh, scans yeah. no, to do a time series with the ALOS two scansar data, you're probably going to use a a terabyte of disk space to to make the time series. It's <laughs> it requires a big computer. The SLCs are sixty gigabytes each. Yes. Yeah. There's a there's another stack processor. There uh, there's three different stack processors. There's StripMap stack for processing StripMap data from ALOS one or other StripMap data sets. Top stack for processing Tops data from the Sentinel one and the ALOS stack for processing the ALOS two uh, stack uh, scans our data. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will share some results with you, maybe through email, so then we can discuss further there. I have few more images 
uh, for the like four or five images for this earthquake for the allows too. But if I start processing, it takes around like 200 gigabytes just for the data. Yeah, so, it takes a lot of space. Yeah. That's uh, uh, just the way they decided to, to process the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. Okay. And if you drink water, you just drink the water. I'm saying I'm, I'm going to fall more. Into Anybody got something to show? Ignacio. Hey, hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Let me show you. Well, yesterday I tried to, to show you a cool result, <laughs> a cool interferon, but it was not possible. But I hope you have something interesting for you all today. Great. Well, something that you can see here is the, the XML um, or the configuration file that I used. And the first thing that I tried was uh, trying to look for a small earthquake that occurred on a geothermal area. It was not possible. I assumed that it was because of atmospheric contributions. The second one was the Acapulco earthquake from 2021, magnitude 7.1, but I found something that I was not pretty clear. I saw a few fringes of the formation fringes, but at the end, I discovered that the problem was, well, actually you already know it, but we are only using the third SWAT. So, and I decided to uh, modify this uh, property uh, until I have decided, I decided to create an interferon ram for, I don't know, you probably know this earthquake. Rich crest. Absolutely, that's it. <laughs> the rich crest earthquake. <laughs> but the thing is that the first try was that I was only obtaining information from this SWAT, sub SWAT, which is the third one. This is not your code yet but most of the deformation is located in the second one. So what I did was to change or add the second swath, as you can see here. Um, that's why it was possible to obtain this whole image. Well, finally, this image, this is the geocoded image and ungrabbed uh, face. So this is my result. I hope to uh, be showing a cool interferon. Right? <laughs> yes, that looks great. And that's it. And that, that was my experience. <laughs> if you desaturated your color palette a little, you might see the the second earthquake a little better, or the first mm -hmm. earthquake really. The, yeah, the change the color the... scale on the plot. Right. Okay. Yeah, that might be a good idea. This is pretty saturated. Yeah. Okay. Because that little that little sort of leg that comes down, that branches off at right angles, is the yeah. is the six point four, yeah, first earthquake. Um, and if you if you get the color palette right, you can see the relative motions across both faults really really nicely. Okay. And attribute you know note with your knowledge of uh, with range change range increase range decrease you should be able to figure out the sensors of motion of both faults if you assume they're both horizontal strike slip faults or Perfect. purely okay. horizontal motions on strike slip faults okay i will try that i'm gonna fix it um and that's it nice and i would, I would like to say thank you for all of this really good information very interesting yes that looks great okay i'll stop sharing I cannot find oh, okay. What is here? Amazing how you can identify an interferogram from any orientation.
you know which earthquake it is if you've looked at it enough times. <laughs> well, it, it also, it's a quite distinctive earthquake with the second, the, the magnitude 6.4 rupture on the side. I was there <laughs> on the day of the first earthquake. They are, like, they are like a seismogram. It's a, a specific, um, like a sign of every earthquake. That image is the sign of that earthquake. So we see it many times that we got familiar with it. That's right. I'm also very familiar with the GPS sites in that area. <laughs> At least the ones that you can, you don't have to go on the Navy base to get to. As I said, you can drive around a lot and put out equipment and that gets you different information, but um, it's amazing what you can do just from your desk. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we have a scheduled break. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to show or any questions they'd like to ask? There were a few questions in the, in the Q and a about, there was one from Kang about, um, is there a template file with all the possible options? And I think there is in the, on the GitHub site. If you download the source code from GitHub, then you get an examples directory. I think that has lots of example input files for different, different satellites. Um, yeah, the, the best way to see all the, um, uh, options is to actually look at the topsap.py file in the, uh, applications directory. Or run it with minus minus help. That, then you can. If you, it takes a little bit of a understanding the Python code, but it's pretty. Every every one of the options that TopSap knows about is in the TopSap.py. And it uh, renders if you run it with minus minus help, right? You get yes. a sort of a stream of them to the to the terminal. <laughs> so there's a lot of options. <laughs> you can probably grep for the one you want. Yeah, the, I mean, having a, yes, or, or looking at some of the templates. It can be a bit overwhelming if you're fairly new to, um, to it, uh, the different options you have. But hopefully uh, what you did yesterday in the course helps you sort out some of those. Right. More questions? We have... I think three or four more minutes and then a break. Uh, Pablo was asking questions about why the, the frames were always shifting around for um, Sentinel-1. And it's, I, I don't know the details of what exactly how their processing system is set up, but they actually process the bursts individually. And then they collect a, some number of bursts and put them out as a slice. And what we get in, in, at the ASF or, or directly from the ESA, I mean, the, the Copernicus download site is a, a slice or a zip file that has some subset of the bursts. And you can put a list of those slices and download a whole a number of slices and put them as a list in your TOPS app uh, input file. And uh, then ICE will figure out which uh, bursts that need to pull from which slices to put make an interferogram. But it is a hassle that sometimes, some dates you will have to download two slices, other dates might only be one slice. It's just a... And I've been in a room full of INSAR, SAR and INSAR people complaining to ESA about this from years ago, and they haven't really completely well, fixed some, it. There's some movement on burst-based processing. Uh, uh, there's some capabilities that are being developed uh, between JPL and ASF, and I think that's going to become available soon. I don't know, Forrest, if you have any state things you can say about that? Um, about burst, burst SLC data or burst INSAR? Burst INSAR. Yeah, so burst INSAR. My team is working on a burst-based um insar tool that you will be able to use to do um basically top tap processing but burst by burst i can get you all the link to the github repository that has it um right now it's um it works it's fully operational but um we are still sanding up some of the rough edges to make sure that the products we're getting out kind of pass our internal uh quality standards but if you want to take a look at it um, go ahead and use it. 
it integrates with ASF's new capabilities for downloading the SLC data burst by burst. Right now, the full um, Sentinel-1 archive isn't available um, to download on a burst by burst level, but another team at ASF is working hard to um, fill out that catalog. But right now, I believe there's um, burst data over the Ridge Crest earthquake, which you could check out, and also burst data over Mount Edgecombe, which was recently identified as active. So those are two good places to look at doing burst by burst NSAR um, with this new tool. With this new tool. Yeah, and if you go to ASF uh, these days and you look at the the search interface, it defaults to Sentinel One, uh, which would be a, a slice based or frame based uh, search. But if you go there now, you can actually uh, switch to Sentinel One bursts, and you oh. can do a burst based search if that's of your liking. So go play around with that too. And if you have questions about it, okay. uh, contact ASF, and the team will help you out. <laughs> yeah, we're very excited about this, and really eager to have any feedback you all have. So Pablo, who was asking the questions originally, I think, is has his hand up. Yeah. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yep, yes we can. Okay, so uh, that uh, last part actually might might have been really helpful at the time it happened, uh, because uh, the actual problem was that um, we basically were working with two full frames, because we we are trying to figure out the the interseismic deformation between the the Scotia and the South American plate. So basically, once I started to work with the uh, with the time series, uh, there was an error when you were trying to bridge the the different phases. You know, one of the many options that MinPyte has. Uh, basically, it was just taking a, a small sample of the whole thing, and uh, I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out why that was happening. And uh, at some point, I realized that it was just a, a really short frame, but. Uh, this this is like a twelve hundred uh, interferogram time series uh, with uh, with the custom settings. So it's like uh, I don't know eight or nine terabytes. So you pretty much just put the down the frame and the path uh, or the double frame in this case, and you just hope for it. It will feed you the, the whole thing, the whole data. So you, I at some point I I went through it uh, manually, uh, and I. I at that point, I didn't really know that it was a problem for MinPy, so uh, I noticed the the frames. I I tried to process them, and then then I I figured out that MinPy wasn't really capable of uh you know taking those out uh, uh on its own, so to say. Like that, not not considering them for the the bridging when the, when the face was uh, was off. So I don't know. And the the question was actually because uh this this shifting that usually happens in in sentinel data it's it's fairly regular it's it's uh shifting let's say northwards uh uh from day to date and then uh, suddenly it, the the frame was just way off like uh, uh way north and and then came back right after that so the question was really about that because uh, i don't know i i mean there was a certain cyclicity in this shifting, uh, as I said, but at some point it just, it, it skipped and then it came back. And I thought it was, uh, uh, I don't know about the, the actual um, the geographical location, or I, I also had some problems with uh, with uh, with data at the beginning of uh, 2018, I believe uh, Sentinel-1B was deployed. And then, as I said, it happened again in San Juan in a different data set. Uh, and it, it, it it was the same thing. It was just regularly shifting and then it skipped way north and then it came back right the next date. So I don't know if that actually happens a lot, if it has happened to you guys uh, with, with large data sets. Pablo, it's uh, in a lot of places, every... they they have a, a, a systematic shift between the Sentinel-1A data and the Sentinel-1B data. I think Rowena had some comment. <laughs> I was just going to say that it's different everywhere in the world, and um, there they did seem to settle on um, defining frames a little more regularly near the end, but um, it's not really anything any of us have any control over. And so what I always tell my students is once you figure out the general area, 
we download all of the images that cover that, not just fixing any particular frame. You um, ignore frames entirely. And you just get the um, kind of the images that are in the archive that touch your area. And it does mean generally downloading a lot. But um, the nice thing about TopSap and the other um, codes we're talking about here is it figures out which bursts are in which of those files and puts them together in the right order. Yeah, this burst by burst processing, I, I actually didn't know it, it worked that way. So it's it's really helpful to know that now. That's new. They just added that. It's a new capability. So now if you go in, uh, just showing you that one more time, is what you will find is something like this, where you can, in the burst search, then interrogate and, and pick uh, specific bursts you want to download. Um, and they will come as safe files, as far as I know, right, uh, Forrest? Um, no, they come in a slightly modified format. You get a a geotiff that looks very similar to the swath geotiffs that you find within a um, SLC save file, and then a large XML um, file that contains all of the metadata from the various annotation, noise, and calibration data sets found within the save files that the burst is from. And yeah, it was developed a little bit to support large scale processing efforts, such as the ones that um, um, the Opera project is doing right now. Uh, they needed to um, have consistent access to the same geographic locations. So, so you have access to bursts now through uh, Vertex and maybe we can, and we're working on the INSA capabilities and also with the JPL team. So, oh. That data, I I would be able to process it the exact same way as I've been doing with ICE, or is it a uh, like a tweaking? So that you I couldn't have to use do with a... you couldn't use TopSap directly, but that um, we have a, a a workflow that you can use under the Hype ICE two repository that uses ICE two and TopSap under the hood to do burst by burst INSAR. Okay, cool. An important caveat um, with burst by burst INSAR, though, is that you need to be careful if your deformation pattern spans more than one burst. In that case, um, wrapping won't be effective because it doesn't have the context of the full deformation field to unwrap correctly. Uh, we're working on ways that you can merge bursts after the fact to try and reconstruct larger deformation patterns, but for now, that's something important to be aware of. OK. I, I think it's it's awesome what you're doing, guys. I'm Especially because uh, with with the nicer coming, I mean, like I'm I'm starting the Magallanes Fagnano fault. I don't know if you've heard about that, and I've, I was always curious why haven't they tried this? Of course, I know more now. Uh, why haven't they tried this in, in Denali? And uh, I think with nicer we we could try that, but it would be really important to be able to process the this uh these really large data sets in a really huge area because we basically have to be far enough to, you know, uh, use a, a right reference pixel and all that to isolate the signal that we're trying to look for. But uh, yeah, all these tools that you're talking about, I didn't really know about many of them and they make like much easier. Yeah, so NICER will not, does not have bursts. So we, we forget about that when you're dealing with NICER. NICER is gonna be processed in frames and the frames are always going to be in the same place. That's one thing that uh, we've been uh, designing from the beginning of the NICER processing is that there's going to be a standard frame and it's always going to, it's not going to be shifting around like this craziness from Sentinel-1. And the, the NICER frames are 240 by 240 kilometers. We We're all looking forward to it. <laughs> we have run out of time. For the session. For the questions. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and the break. No, should we, uh, do you, what do you think, Gareth? Should we give people five minutes or so? I think so. Yeah, you uh, take five minutes to refill your coffee cup and get ready with Open Star Lab. That's going to be really exciting. Gareth is showing you modeling and uh, all the cool uh, examples you you showed today those are the ones you can then after the fact run through that same approach i think so uh, we shall see. Up for a really fun one hour five minutes
Well, I'm back. Um, hello. Hello. Um, I guess it is my my session, so I shall just start. Um, and I will share my screen. The right thing. Okay. So hopefully you can see my browser window. Um, we have made it all the way to 3.1, preparing inside data for modeling. Um, I think that's what it's called on, on the system anyway. And there are a number of notebooks in here that you will, uh, I will demo some of um, for you. Um, and the, the topic is going to be how do we how do we um, how do we start the process of modeling data in a more serious kind of way? Um, and there are a few things you need to have if you want to make a geophysical model of of inside data. One thing you need is is a code that can actually um, uh, produce model displacements uh, of the thing that you are trying to study. So I am going to show you the ACADA code, which can model um, both uh, shear sources, so things that are involved sl sliding on a surface, so faults uh, are, the, are the thing that we study with that. And also it can model um, opening. Uh, so you can use it to study um, dikes and sills in volcanic systems also. And, um, so you need that and you need some way of handling line of sight. So you need to be able to relate the um, displacements of the surface to the 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 thing that the INSAR actually sees, which is the def deformation in, in the line of sight direction, whether you have range increase or range decrease. So you need some um, line of sight information. Um, and the third thing is you need to, to manage your data set in such a way that um, you're not trying to model millions of pixels because the, the, the more things you, the more data you try to model, um, the the longer the computation will take when you try to run your model. So we typically try to reduce the the number of effective pixels in your in your data set from what are potentially millions in a single interferogram to a few hundred. And then once you have a few hundred pixels that are representative of the data set, then your model will run much, much, much faster. Um, so we'll probably start, I think, with ACADA. Um, so this ACADA LOS components notebook second one on my list. Um, this is a uh, notebook that will allow you to 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 make a forward model of of uh, of, a, of an earthquake and see what the displacements look like using a card. So that we'll start by running through these these steps. You don't have to run this first code cell. I've commented it out um, because this this code is installed so long as you're using the Earthscope INSAR uh, kernel. Um, everything we need should be here. So when we run this first thing with all the with all the importing all the dependencies, hopefully everything runs fine and you get everything. You get a, a nice number and it doesn't crash. All right, for now, um, there are inputs into into uh, the ACADA subroutine. And what we're using is a thing called ACADA wrapper, which was written by uh, uh, Ben Thompson from Harvard. Um, it is basically just an import of the original ACADA code into, into Python. Um, that's great. So we don't have to <laughs> figure out how to do that ourselves. Um, a carder input takes as input um, some elastic parameters, so some something that defines the material properties of the of the crust. Um, just take it from me that we typically use two Lame elastic parameters that are thirty gigapascals is the is the shear strength of the crust. Um, in in the elastic strength of the crust, and just go with it. <laughs> That's the number that everyone uses. And here we can define some parameters of a fault. Uh, for those of you who are geologists, these terms will probably make sense. For those of you who aren't, maybe less so. Strike is the orientation of the fault. Um, it's the direction the fault is, is pointing, basically. Um, so this is in degrees. This is one degree. So it's, I basically picked a value which is very close to, to due north. Uh, dip is the, the angle the fault is tilting or dipping. Uh, to the right of the strike direction. So if you're looking north, this fault is dipping to the east. Um, and 85 degrees is pretty steep. The rake is the direction that the fault moves. Um, one is left lateral. 
uh, it was zero, it was left, pure left lateral. So anyway, this fault, when you look across it, the fault moves to the left. It's going to slip two meters. It's going to have a length of 15,000 meters, a, a, a width, which is the, 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 the down dip size of the fault. Uh, it's going to be 10,000 meters. The center of the fault is going to be at 6,000 meters depth. And we'll give it um, the coordinates of the center of the fault are going to be um, at zero, zero in our, in our model. So anyway, if you have any questions about that, we can probably talk about it at length some other time. Um, for now, just take it from me. These are, these are good, a good test set of, of, of values. So the Akata subroutine, I, I've, I've written some, some text here about it. Um, it was, this this comes from a paper that was written um, uh, in uh, the eighties. Um, Ricardo he took the elastic dislocation equations and integrated them and did so without making any mistakes. Several other people had tried to do this and got it wrong. Um, this was the first successful attempt to actually analytically solve these equations for the the problem of a elastic a rectangular fault in an elastic half space. Um, the fact that that Okada was successful and also shared the code to calculate the, the displacement field, which is now being used in this notebook, um, meant that you know lots and lots and lots of people used it and were were grateful for the for the uh, successful. Uh, solution and and this paper now has thousands of, of citations and if you click on this link you actually can read it if you like and the equations are quite quite long <laughs> um yeah there is a website in japan the japanese website where all these things are stored and you know here's all the things that were solved and it's there's a lot going on there <laughs> If you're if you if you're heroic, maybe you can read it sometime and try and understand it. Most people just use it. Um, but this is the geometry of the thing that we're trying to solve. So, um, Ricardo made certain simplifying assumptions about the the geometry that that there's using. Um, there is a reference point on the fault. We're going to take that reference point to be the middle of the fault. Um, he assumed that the fault was aligned with the x-axis in three-dimensional space. Um, and that that means when you actually do the calculation, you have to rotate your coordinate system to the orientation of the fault you want, and then you have to rotate the displacements as well into the orientation that you want. Um, I won't dwell on that, but it, it's a bit of a pain. And I have gone through the math and done it in this notebook, so you can see how it how it happens if you are at all curious. If you're not at all curious, just run it and. Um, and we'll get on with it. So we calculate the the location of the center of the fault um, with respect to all these other things. We can calculate the amount of strike slip and dip slip uh, on the fault. Fault slip in the direction of the strike and slip in, slip in the direction of the dip. Um, that's what this this the cell does. We calculate a rotation matrix that allows you to rotate the co the the fault into the actual orientation that you want it to be in, or really rotate the coordinates with respect to the fault in the orientation you want. Um, it was a bit, I had to think hard about this <laughs> once um, to, to, to write this code, but now it's done. I don't have to think about it again. And this cell here will actually run Okada. So it's going to make a, a grid of coordinates that you can resolve your, you want to calculate your displacements on, like all the locations you want a, a displacement. We're going to look at basically a 50 kilometer uh, wide area. Um, and we're going to have 101 divisions, which I guess makes this, I think, 500 meter pixels um, in X and Y. And um, we're going to create space for the outputs. Um, and then we just loop through every point on our grid and we calculate a card at every point. And we do the rotation of the of the coordinates and the rotation of the displacements into the into that grid. So you run that, this will take a little while. And at the bottom here, you'll see um, it actually will plot it as well. So what output you get are the displacements, theoretical displacements for a fault, which is oriented in, in this case that we're running north-south. Um, and we'll and we provide displacements in the x direction, which is east-west, um, the y direction, which is north-south, and the z direction, which is vertical. Um, so positive east, positive north, positive up is the coordinate system here. 
Uh, and you can see um, that the largest displacements are in the Y direction. Uh, this stands to reason because the fault is actually oriented north-south or very close to it. And so if the fault is moving in a strike-slip sense, which means it's moving um, horizontally along the fault um, in the direction of the fault, the largest displacement should be in the direction of the fault as well, which is very close to north-south. So here you see large north displacements and somewhat smaller east and, and vertical displacements. The fact that you get these vertical displacements actually is because the fault is pinned at its ends. Uh, the fault has a finite length. So when when you get to the end of the fault, it gets squeezed when it's moving um, by the, the moving blocks of crust on either side. So you get these little up warping and down warping areas um, from the fault uh, ends. And um, similarly, you get actually a quite complicated pattern of horizontal displacements uh, in the fault perpendicular direction as a result of the fault ending abruptly. Um, the, the whole crust is bending uh, in, in, in a way. And um, so you actually get quite significant um, east-west displacements as well. But as I say, the most significant displacements are in the direction of the fault. Right, of course, this is not what INSAR sees. If you had GPS stations set out here, maybe you would be able to measure all three of these things uh, at those stations, but not everywhere because GPS only makes point measurements. One of the beauty, beautiful things about INSAR is it measures over a, a wide area at fine spatial sampling, but it only records deformation in the line of sight of the satellite. Um, so what we have to do is, is calculate what the, the expected line of sight vector is for this area and project these displacements into it. Um, so if you um, if you know the, 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 the azimuth of the pointing direction and you know the instance angle of the radar, um, you can calculate this. And I've given you the, the, um, the, 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 the math here um, for range change. So you can see there's a negative sign. These, these, these are the three vector components for the pointing vector, the unit pointing vector. And you can see that the Z component is negative, which means that um, basically it's positive down. Um, so what you can do then is you can assume values of the, of the incidence angle, uh, which I've given as theta, and also the, the pointing azimuth, which is given as phi. Um, and the the torturous, slightly torturous um, uh, de definition of what that point that pointing azimuth direction actually is, according to ICE, is the 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 angle from the ground target to the satellite in degrees counterclockwise from north. Um, and the the numbers that you get typically are negative and quite large. So negative 260 degrees, I don't know if you think, is the same as 260 de degrees clockwise. <laughs> so slightly pointing slightly um, south of pure west, uh, which is correct for a satellite that is flying in an ascending track. If you were in a descending track, then you would have negative 100, which would be 100 degrees uh, clockwise. Um, anyway. You can pick which which one of these you want. I'm going to use the the uh, ascending one for now. I'm going to use a theta of 39 degrees, uh, which is approximately the angle, the incidence angle for the center of the center subswath of Sentinel One. I've given you the angles here for what they actually what they approximately are. Um, okay, so 39 degrees from the vertical is the is the is the incidence angle, and um, the uh, the pointing azimuth we're going to use is, is 260 degrees clockwise. Um, so if you think about it, um, which of the two components would be larger, the east or the north, for an, an, for an uh, radar that's pointing at 39 degrees from the vertical? Would you expect the, the, the north component, uh, the east component or the vertical component to contribute more? You have a couple of guesses, right? So remember the the the, the 
for, for now we're just going to assume i guess that the the satellite is an ascending track and it's flying almost north south slightly to the west of north so we're just going to consider the east component which is um the hor the main horizontal component that insar should see and the vertical component um the angle is 39 degrees to the vertical so it's, it's a slightly acute angle um I haven't seen anyone. Uh, say vertical yet. <laughs> if you actually run this code cell, you get the, the, the sizes of the three the three components. Uh, so the x component is as zero point six. Uh, the the y component is point one. And the Z component is minus 0.777. So actually in amplitude, the vertical component is the largest. And that's because the uh the angle is very close, it's closer to the vertical. It's 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 shallower than 45 degrees, which means most of the pointing is in the down the direction. If the angle were greater than 45 degrees, it would be pointing more horizontally than vertically. Um if that makes sense. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to take our three horizontal displacement components and we're going to scale them by these um, these line of sight vector components. And we're going to assume for the sake of this notebook that all of these are, um, all of the, the line, of, line of sight angle is fixed across the whole swath. Of course, if you actually have pixel by pixel information on these, on these angles, the incidence angle and the pointing azimuth angle, then you can do it pixel by pixel, which we will do later. But, but for the time being, no, we won't, we won't do that. So in order to, to project the, um, the line of sight into the, uh, in, uh, the, the displacements into line of sight, basically you take the dot product between the, the pointing vector and the displacement vector which is the same thing as scaling each of these three things by their corresponding um, vector component uh, and then adding them all up. And so this, this cell here uh, does that. Okay, so you'll see that this is quite different from what we saw before. Um, in, in pure east, north and up displacement, the Y displacement was the largest by far, by a factor of two or more. The other two components were small. But given that the, com the contribution of the Y component is, is small, this very large displacement, when you multiply it by its line of sight vector contribution, basically goes to almost nothing. However, on the other side, um, the East component and the vertical component uh, still contribute quite a lot. So when you add all these things together, the deformation pattern you see is dominated by these two things. Um, and you get this quite unusual or unexpected perhaps pattern where all of the displacement seems to be on one side of the fault and you have almost nothing on the other side of the fault. And this comes from the constructive and destructive interference between, or when you sum these things together, the displacements on the west side of the fault here, this is positive plus positive and negative plus negative. So you get big positive, big negative on one side. And then you have positive plus negative and negative plus positive, which more or less cancel out. So you get this pattern with all the displacements um, on one side of the fault, which is when we saw this for the first time um, in an earthquake in Iran, uh, we were very confused by the pattern and it took making a model like this to understand that it wasn't wrong. It was, it wasn't like we weren't seeing something crazy. It was just that we hadn't really in anticipated how these components might add together to give you the pattern that you get. Um, you could also see what the, the descending interferogram would look like by switching. You can change the comment here. You can uncomment this one and comment that one. Um, so when we do this, okay, what you can see right now uh, for the ascending track is the X component of displacement has a positive um, coefficient. The Y component is positive and the Z component is negative. If you run it for the, the descending track, the main difference is now that the, that the X component becomes negative uh, and the Z component stays negative. The Y component 
stays positive. So we have flipped the east component of displacement when we do this. So when we run the model again, what happens this time is that all the displacement in the, that you would get in your interferogram flips to the east side of the fault. And that's because you now have reversed the x component of this uh, of x the x contribution to line of sight so that now you get the the destructive interference on the west side of the fault and the constructive interference on the east side of the fault so when the whole displacement pattern flips like this it's a signal that perhaps the, your, your deformation is is mostly horizontal <laughs> because you have basically flipped the X component of line of sight and that has affected the uh, of the, affected the model strongly. And you can play with this. You can change the orientation of the fault to something else and and see what it does. You can you can decide, for example, that you want a fault that has a strike of 60 degrees. You can run all these things again and you'll get a different pattern of uh, of your model. So this would be a fault that's that's now oriented in in another different direction, and you can see in this case the 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 displacements are dominated by by x displacements, and the y displacements are also quite large. The vertical displacements are small, and that's because the fault is now pointing more towards the east. Uh, when you when you scale all the it, the contributions to line of sight, the east component becomes the dominant one, and you get a very different looking pattern. And if you were to reverse the the um, if you were to go from descending to ascending, you would probably reverse this pattern. Uh, so I will comment this back out and uncomment this one again, and run it again, and you'll see that the pattern reverses. So that's just a, a guide to um, how how displacements resolve into line of sight. And it's always helpful to have um, a model, a toy model like this to play with just to see what you would expect to see, because sometimes you it helps to interpret what, what you end up seeing. And you can get some of these parameters, these things. Um, seismologists will estimate some of these things for you, like the strike, dip, and rake can be estimated from seismic data. Um, so that you can have in advance before the, before maybe your SAR data are required over your earthquake, you can actually have a have a go at kind of guessing what what the pattern might look like. Um, so there that that's that's the first thing. Okay, so we have we have a carter and we have line of sight information. And if if you have those two things, then you can then you can reproduce potentially forward model in this case the sorts of things that might be happening in your data. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is how you go about downsampling your interferogram. Because remember, you want you you want to to reduce the number of effective pixels in your data from millions to a few hundred. Um, the reason you can do this at all is that if you look at an interferogram, um, especially if you're far away from the from the area where the actual deformation occurred or the the event was centered. Um, the displacements are often very similar <laughs> in in a uh, over quite a large large area, which means that you just don't need every single one of those pixels that barely moved to represent an area that barely moved. You can basically say, on on average, this whole area uh, didn't move very much, and it moved about this much and in this direction, and then that will be enough to represent that area in your in your model. Um, and one of the reasons to do this is that the, the calculation of displacement is done pixel by pixel. So if you want to run your model lots of times, you're going to have to make that calculation lots of times. So the, the more you can reduce the, the volume of data that you're modeling, the, the faster your code will run. Uh, so to do this downsampling, we're going to use a, 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 a strategy called quadri decomposition. Um, a quadri decomposition defines an area of data, a max a sort of a maximum size of 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 of, of data, a, a window, and calculates the variance of the data within that window. And if the variance is larger than some threshold that you specify, the 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 algorithm goes, okay, I'm going to divide this into four smaller squares, four smaller areas, and calculate the variance in those. 
And if again, the variance is above a threshold, it will divide it up again and keep dividing it up until you reach some minimum size that you have, you have specified. And what this does overall is it, it, it focuses your sampling in areas where there's a lot of variance, which is probably a lot of signal. Um, and it will give you very coarse sampling in areas where there isn't anything going on. Uh, we are using a tool called Kite, which was written by the people that wrote PyRocco. You can go to the PyRocco website and they have a whole suite of tools that you can use to study earthquakes using INSAR and seismic data. It's a really neat set of routines. Um, I don't have time to go through it all, but we, we will use Kite today to, to do quad tree decomposition. Okay, so we can import all the things. And if you're running the the, the Earthscope Insar uh, kernel, these things should run just fine. The next cell here does a data download, and we're going to look at earthquake data from an earthquake that happened in 2020 in Turkey on the East Anatolian Fault. If you run this cell, you will download all these things, and it downloads them straight into the directory here, and I have already done it. But if you if you run it like so, in my case, it will tell me, oh, it's going to do it again. Why not? Um, and hopefully you'll see that the names of the files are, are things that you may have seen already, uh, from, from running TopSAP. So we have the unwrapped interferogram. We have the line of sight information in geocoded coordinates. We have, this is the correlation data. So showing you where the correlation is high and low, we will use that as a mask and I have a water mask. Um, which is one over land and zero over water. And if you want to mask out water, this is a very effective way of doing it. Although I am not sure how how or if that water mask routine works still anymore. <laughs> it was a built-in function in, in old ice um, that I think may have stopped working. But we, we could probably highlight you some um, workarounds so while we're waiting here, were there any questions? I see one in the Q&A. Yeah, uh, Q&A about there. If I have to imagine this model in 3D, the strike of the fault plane of movement is along the y-axis for the first example you showed. Yeah, the strike was north. So that means that the if you were to... Um, so the one way of thinking of dip and strike of faults, which is the, something that we, we we train geologists to measure, to measure dips and strikes of of not just faults but um, but rock rock sedimentary rock beds, um, it's like the roof of a house, which is tilted. The the strike is like the ridge line of the roof, the orientation of the ridge of the roof. The if you were to draw a horizontal line on the fault plane, that would be in the strike direction. And then the dip is the the, sl the slope of the roof. So in this case, it's pointing. I think it was one degree off north. So yeah, that that's that's the orientation of the fault. It'd be also what the if the fault intersected with the ground surface and the ground surface was perfectly horizontal, it would be that line of intersection of the of the um, the fault with the surface. Okay. So here in, in the next cell, we are just pointing to some, some file names. Um, we have the, the path to the interferogram files. And since we just downloaded them into the directory we're in, that's just dot slash, that's current directory. If you, if you have them in a different place, you can, you can deal with that by putting the full path to the file here. Uh, the file, the interferogram name is felt top of phrase unwrap.geo. The correlation file name is core top of phase core .geo. In this case, um, those two files, uh, both, sorry. In this case, the interferogram files and also the line of sight file are in the same directory. So the path to the interferogram is the same as the path to the, path to the interferogram is the same as the path to the line of sight information. But if they're in different directories, as they are for, um, when you run processing on in strip map app, it actually doesn't put them in the same place. Then you can provide a different path if you want to. 
Um, we have also our watermask file here, and I have a flag saying use watermask is true. If you don't have a watermask, which probably be, will will be the case for most most interferograms you process on your own, uh, you can set this to false and it won't try to use it. And I also have given it. Uh, I provided a name for the for the files that will be produced by by this this um, notebook. Uh, so Alazig is the name of the earthquake we're looking at, and this is the ascending interferogram. So that's what I've tagged it. Run that. Um, a couple more things you want to specify. One is the radar wavelength. Um, that This is the, the, the wavelength for Sentinel-1. This is the Sentinel-1 top sap interferogram. And also some correlation threshold. You can exclude data uh, whose correlation is below this value. And this you can basically uh, set by trial and error. I've used 0.25. You might actually want to use slightly something slightly higher than that. Um, you can see what it does if you if you change it. Uh, but for now, let's just keep it at 0.25. Okay. So next thing we need to do is load in the data. Um, uh, and we're going to do this, these steps. So you can read in the, the interferogram, you can read in the correlation information, you can read in the line of sight information, and you can mask them if you if you have a mask. We're going to plot the interferogram and look at it. Uh, if you want to crop it, we're not going to bother with that today, but you can um, specify the crop bounds if you want to, to, to look at the smaller area. We'll convert the displacements to meters. We'll mask out low correlation areas. Um, we will take some coordinate system information and, and feed that into into the kite routines, and we will um, import them into kite. Um, and again, I've kind of done that for you. Um, but the first thing typically you would want to do is take the interferogram that you've downloaded and plot it. So um, the routines here, this reads it in. Um, it, using a GTAL routine to open the file. Um, this gets the second band of that of that interferogram file that we're opening and reads it in as a, a NumPy array. And then this here just plots it. Um, and this is what you get. Okay, so you, um, we have positive and negative range change along some trend. Um, this is a very similar type of uh, fault to the, the one I... I ran last um, in the other notebook, this this kind of thing. Actually, that's remarkably similar. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be quite so good. Um, you can see most of the displacement is here. And as you move further and further away, um, less and less is going on. So if we were to sample this, we would want, we would hope that the, the routine would sample densely around here and coarsely around here. And there are hints of decorrelation and that got unwrapped by snafu up here that we might want to mask out because it's probably not real um if you wanted to crop it you can change the the row you can add the row numbers that you want to crop it between uh the minimum number and the maximum number you can see they the numbers start from the top left the northwest corner and increase downwards and 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 eastwards southwards and eastwards uh, so you could change these numbers as set up it's going to use the whole interferogram and that's fine. Uh, it also does some other stuff. It reads in the correlation file, the line of sight file. It applies a water mask. It converts the displacements by multiplying by the uh, by the wavelength divided by four pi. Um, it, it nans out anything that is below the correlation threshold, and then it will plot it. Um, it will import it. This is the part where it imports it into into um, kite. That's all done for you. Uh, but we can plot the um, the the imported interferogram with all of these corrections made, and so we see the correlation mask has masked out a bunch of bad pixels. Uh, we now have some some lakes and rivers in here that weren't there before, um, but you can still see the, the the most of the deformation pattern is still present in in the data. Uh, we've just taken out some some bad information. Um, right. The next step is to actually do the quadri decomposition. And since the the those clever German people who wrote this this um, this Python library have done all the heavy lifting for you, initiating the quadri is as simple as one command, um, which is running here. 
and then uh, once it's initiated, you can you can add a few different things. Um, so you can specify the the variance threshold. So like the value, some value of variance in 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 um, in displacement core uh, in displacement units um, that you would use to divide your data up into boxes. Um, the number of NANs allowed per per quad tree cell. If it gets more than a certain number, it will just ignore that cell, and that's good for places where the data is really kind of like bad or like these lake areas. You don't want to use those really in your data because you don't have data from those areas. Um, and you can specify maximum and minimum tile sizes in degrees, uh, longitude and latitude. And by trial and error, I found these values and you can use these for now. Um, later on, when you come to play around with this on your own, you can change these values. But anyway, you can apply these um, and it will have, once you've applied all these things, it will have actually sampled your data um behind the scenes and to prove that it did something <laughs> you can run this and it actually goes and looks at the number of quad tree cells that it that it that it set up uh it, it has 194 there are 194 sampled areas from this interferogram i just made and if you want to see the details if you don't believe it um you can get it to print out where they all are so it will give you some coordinate in longitude some co coordinate in latitude and some coordinate and some some mean value which is the actual average of the of the displacements in the, in in that box um a better thing to do really is to just to plot them um which is what's done in the next uh, code cell here so you run this it'll actually show you how it samples your interferogram and this is what it looks like so you can see maybe up here these boxes are quite large. These are half degree some, uh, cells. Uh, as you get closer and closer, you see they get smaller. Uh, and when you're looking right at the area where all the action was, all the displacement from the earthquake, the, the sample sizes are very small. Um, so it's doing its job. It's 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 sampling the data in places where you uh, where you need it to represent the earthquake. Um, and so that the rest that really um another thing that i i didn't mention i mentioned that we imported the line of sight information but um what what the the the, the kite routine does is it it comes up with a representative point which is the the centroid the cent the 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 sort of average center of of each cell and 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 um assigns the average value of all of the displacements in that box to that point and calculates the line of sight vector for that point, which is extremely useful because now we can we can basically all we have to do is save all the coordinates that it comes up with, uh, along with their line of sight information, and we have enough information to um, to use this in a model. I do one more thing um, at this point. I convert from uh, latitude, longitude coordinates, geographical coordinates to actually a local coordinate system based on a uh, universal transverse Mercator projection, basically that, that converts the degrees, latitude, longitude to meters, uh, or actually in this case, kilometers, because um, the ACADA system does not work in geographical coordinates. It works in, in rectilinear Cartesian coordinates. And so when we convert the coordinate system to to uh, UTM kilometers, then we have um, we have something we can model with a CADA. So this little section here just goes through and post processes the the output of the quadri to do those things. It will convert the uh, it will it will assign the coordinates to uh, a reference latitude and longitude um, and convert them to U UTM meters. And it will sample um, the, it will calculate the line of sight vector from the information that's contained within um, Kite, just like we did uh, for that fixed line of sight case in the other notebook. Um, and it will convert the coordinates to kilometers. And at the very end, we'll plot the points that you end up getting in your rectilinear coordinate system that are the sampled displacements from that earthquake. So here you are, this is, this is your 194 points. And these are their displacements in meters. 
So you see you have about ooh, I don't know, 15 centimeters plus or minus um, displacement for this earthquake. Um, and then we outport, export it as a text file, uh, just using this NumPy save text routine. Um, and we can save it both in um, in UTM kilometers, which is the preferred output format for, for that I use. And then you can also save it in lat long coordinates if you want. Um, that's also done here. And you can also save the the all the information in um in a file that that kite can read again if you want. Um I don't think you need to in this case, but if you wanted to, you can you can export that as well. So hopefully that ran without any issues. Um and we can take our, our file, which uh is called alazic asc.okinv which has seven columns um, and read this into a routine that will then model it. So these seven columns are the X coordinate, the Y coordinate of the point, the displacement that's represented by that point from the quad 3 decomposition, and then the line of sight vector for that point in range change in this case. You can see um, a, a large, um, East component, a small north component, and an even larger C component, which is negative because it's pointing downwards. So this this pointing vector is is correct for ascending. It's pointing positive east, positive north, negative up. So it's pointing down at an angle. Okay. What you can do with this? Well, one thing um, is this notebook here is just forward modeling now at using those points rather than calculating it on a grid. Uh, so you can run this notebook again, uh, again with the, the loading in some dependencies. You'll see that this one um, uses a routine called ACARP, which is just my ACADA uh, code written into a, a separate Python file. So you don't have to see all the, the gory details of like all the rotations and projections and all that stuff that's all done this will load the data in that we have just sampled uh, and you can see what you loaded in by running this and you see it's an array with lots of numbers i should have said that the the final column is just the 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 number <laughs> of the row um, um you can import or you can you can guess some some parameters for this fault so i'm just going to guess the strike of 60 which is uh, approximately the orientation of of the fault if you go back to uh here i reckon this line is is tilted at somewhere near 60 degrees i don't know something like that um you can estimate i guess the fault is vertical i'll I'll say the rake is something close to left lateral, close to zero, two meters of slip. I, I eyeballed a location for the, the fault at the surface, the center of the fault at the surface, um, just by saying, oh, I think it's somewhere around here. And, and you know, actually in geographical coordinates, you can kind of guess where that is, somewhere about here, probably. So you guess a starting point, why not? Um, guess the length of the fault, guess uh, uh, the top and the bottom depth of the fault, and then you can you can make a, an array out of this that you can feed into my Okapi routine, uh, and also some elastic parameters. And we're going to use 30 gigapascals like before. When you run this, it will just calculate the forward displacements, and we can plot them. Um, so like this is on the left, the data on the right is a forward model. It's not, it doesn't look too bad. It looks ballpark, possibly okay. At least it's close enough that you could use this as a starting point. Um, and you can also um, calculate how well this fits that by subtract, subtracting the displacement at every pixel um, and um, calculating a misfit, much like um, uh, Franz did uh, on Monday with, uh, with the... Uh, the Mogi models that we were looking at. And you'll get some number, um, 0.4 meters squared, which is actually not great. 
<laughs> there's one more thing we have to do to actually get a true residual, which is we do not know what zero is. That's a that's an issue with INSAR. Like the all these measurements are relative, whereas um, the forward model is going to assume that the displacements far away from the from the earthquake are going to be zero. You can see here that these displacements far away from the earthquake are not zero. Um, so what we what we do is we we find the average shift between the between this this data and this this forward model and subtract that as well, and that give you the a, tr a, a more accurate residual penalty function. We would call that so 0.3 meters squared, which is better than 0.4, but there is some room for improvement here. Um, um, right, we can go further on, but. You can see that my my guess, although it's pretty good, it's not it's not perfect. Um, what you can do to assess how how imperfect it is is actually subtract the the, the model from the data uh, and plot what you get left behind here, which we call the residual. And you can see we're not fitting the data over here very well. These are large negative values. There's some quite large positive values here, here, and here. Um, so what we're going to do now is actually get the computer to to try and fit this for us uh, and that's in this notebook called a card a copy optimization uh, so what we're going to do is use an algorithm called the powell algorithm uh, which is built into scipy which is a whole bunch of scientific computing libraries to do model type things uh, and we will get that algorithm to to manipulate the parameters of the model the strike, the dip, the rake, the length of the fault, the depth of the fault, all those things, and the position of the fault to try and actually match the two patterns uh, and get the, the best fitting model. Okay, so once again, we, we start with some dependencies. Um, uh, we'll load the data in here. This is Elazig ask ascending.oconv. Um, and what we will do is we will specify some bounds uh, and some parameters. So these are basically the, very similar to the numbers I showed you in the previous notebook. Um, uh, but but now we're giving two numbers. We're giving the the, the guess and also some number which um, allows you to uh, specify some bounds. Um, these, these are effectively sigmas, so standard deviations. So uh, I will specify bounds of two standard deviations from my, my central value. So if I set a sigma of 10 degrees for the strike, it's really going to specify plus or minus 20 degrees either side of 60 degrees for the strike. It'll be 30 degrees either side of vertical for the dip. So that's I mean, 60 degrees dipping one way to 60 degrees dipping the other way. Uh, 20 plus or minus 40 degrees from pure left lateral slip, uh, rake, uh, slip here, plus or minus two meters, plus or minus one and a half meters, and so on and so on and so on, all the way through this long strike length, the top depth, the bottom depth of the fault. Um, and it will make um, bounds for these values, and high bound, low bound, and select a random, a randomly a starting model from within those upper and lower bounds. Uh, and print out what that starting model is in terms of these values. So it's going to start with a strike of 673, a dip of 114, a rake of minus 20, slip of 60 centimeters, uh, X and Y positions for the fault, the length of the fault, top and bottom depth of the fault. These are in meters, as are the coordinates here. Uh, and I will also specify some elastic parameters. Okay, so using the same routine I showed you in the previous notebook, we can calculate what the penalty is for this starting model um, with the zero level shift removed. And my starting model is really bad compared to what I showed you just there in the previous notebook. This is 1.78. Remember, I was getting like 0.3. Okay, but that's just a starting model. Um, and we're going to use the Powell algorithm and the optimize minimize function in SciPy to to do this um so the powell algorithm is a direction set method it, it basically picks one of the parameters at random and decides to to change it until and see what it does to the misfit if if making a change in one direction 
improves the misfit, it will keep going in that direction. So for example, if it wanted to make the, the fault dip more shallowly, it will keep making the fault dip more shallowly until it doesn't improve the fit anymore. And then it will pick another parameter and change that one. And after it cycled through a few, um, a few parameters, it actually starts using directions, combinations of parameters to define these directions of, of, of change. It's quite clever and it's, it's quite efficient. Um, and so we, we let this run until it, it finds a model which it can't improve anymore. And at that point, it stops. Um, so the command to run that, that inversion is just here. Uh, so we will, I will run it now. And it might take a little while because it's going to run lots and lots of forward models, right? It's going to calculate a forward model, calculate the misfit. It's going to change the model, calculate another forward model, calculate the misfit, and do this lots and lots of times until it finds an answer that it, it, it can't improve. So we're going to sit here and wait as this, this thing goes. When, when it's done, I will actually, I'll just run this cell now. Our results will pop up. Okay, so you can see um, a few things are, are listed here. Like these are the parameter values that it got um, from running the inversion. This is the the misfit that it calculated, the penalty that it calculated, um, which is a lot smaller than I, the one I started with. I started with one point seven three, and it got down to zero point zero eight five. That's a pretty good return, uh, and then it actually. If you if you looked at this in detail, it would show you all the directions that it it tried in the algorithm to like to uh, all the things it tested and the number of times it ran, uh, the number of iterations, which is five thousand seven hundred sixty three. <laughs> so it ran a card that many times just to get this one answer, um, which is which is a lot. Which is why you want to minimize the number of data you're trying to model as much as you can, because if you're running it 5,000 times it's going, and you're running it on lots of points, it will take a lot, lot, lot longer to run. Okay, so um, if we run the next cell here, it actually produces this in a, in a digestible form, perhaps. Um, uh, and here you, here you are. Um, you could also, if you wanted to, um, to show um all of your uh parameters as, as as a single array you could just do it saves the your fault parameters as f params dot out or f params out so you can run this in a code cell and you'll get this array here so um i propose if you will run this <laughs> yourselves you you will start with different starting models because it's selected at random and you start from a random starting point and you get to a random ending uh you get to a an ending point which it tries where it's tried to m move from your starting model to a better one hopefully um i have made a spreadsheet here that i will share with you all in the chat For you to paste in your name, your penalty, and your parameters. So I will do this in maybe a few goes. Optimization. So my name, my penalty is this. this. Is my final penalty 0 0.085 blah. I will paste that. Don't pick a pick a lane to yourself so i'm going to i'm going to pick this row cuz no one's in it my name is gareth and i will type will then take my parameter array here and paste it in there uh right let's see i want it all on one line <laughs> When you paste it, actually paste it up in the FX field. There you go. <laughs> the voice of it, uh, the voice of uh, experience there. <laughs> Done. Okay, and what we'll see is that everyone's 
everyone's final model is, is very slightly different each time. Some sometimes they will be good and sometimes bad. Isis, it looks like you're using the initial penalty, not the final one. Hopefully, the final penalty is better than the than that initial one. Well, Gareth, I hope you're not winning. Are you still leading? <laughs> uh, someone can. Some yeah. spread some spreadsheet whiz can figure oh, out whether I won or not. <laughs> Eight, five. But yeah, so what we are doing here, uh, as the as the results roll in, is something very very similar to what we would do um, programmatically if we were trying to solve for the minimum misfit model. What you can see here is that you get different end models um, from, from different starting models. So despite this being an attempt to find a minimum in, in your uh, minimum misfit model, there are more than one, there's more than one minimum model that you can find. And it seems to depend with whatever model you started with. Um, you have a different starting model, you have a different initial penalty, you'll have a different final model with a different final penalty. Um, and that's because um, if you imagine that, that, that your misfit value is really a function of all of these, these fault parameters, um, there are probably lots of places where you could fall into holes. <laughs> and find a minimum that's not the best minimum. It's a bit like if you imagine what you want to do on the surface of a planet is find the deepest crater. One way that you could try and do that is by walking around in a random direction from a random starting location until you get to a bottom of a crater. And then you say, okay, I found a crater. And then you record the depth. Uh, but if you if you run it, walk into a small crater before there's a bigger one, uh, in the same direction, you might never get to the big crater uh, from that starting location. So randomizing your starting location and doing it lots of times, you will eventually find that that deeper crater, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, and by running, by all of you running it uh, simultaneously, it's a bit like parallelizing the, the the modeling job that we would do. Normally, we would just loop through from lots of different random starting points and run this algorithm say a hundred times and then see the uh, the model that fits best. So who's got the best model? Has anyone figured that out? You can sort, right? I, I can, I, I want to, I, I know there's spreadsheet whizzes out there. <laughs> Who knows which button to click? It It's a, uh... It's in data somewhere, right? Anyway. Let's see. Uh, let's see. That's where the, all the 0.8s are. How many have we got? Oh, we still got people entering their model. 0.3? Oh, 0.3. That's no. large. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Sometimes it just falls into a, a very shallow hole and doesn't get out, right? The way it goes sometimes. Anyway, I think we'll we'll give give people a little bit of time to 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 get their models in here. I can show you the rest of you uh, what you can do. Um, basically, down here um, at the bottom of the notebook, I have it set up so that it actually does the the manual looping rather than crowdsourcing the the solution and getting people to run it lots of times at the same time. Uh, you could just set like a best param best final parameter you can run it a hundred times and you can basically do this whole thing a hundred times one after the other and it, ev after every run it will compare your results to see if they're as good as the best ones and if they're better then it keeps them and at the end you you get the best model but this takes quite a while to run actually because um you saw how long it took to run once running it a hundred times is it's going to take longer than we have, but if you want to model your own things later on, this this is this is a way to do that. Okay. 
So do we have someone? Can we? Is someone want to appoint themselves as the the finder of the the minimum misfit? Now that we have a bunch uh, of models in here, I did a look up at the bottom, and it was Rod Rodrigo. Rodrigo, you get the prize, whatever that prize is. Where where's the model gone? <laughs> oh, here we are. Uh, could Ooh, you Rodrigo. Go? Could you highlight the answer? It's the one at the top here. Okay. Okay. So what we can do, we can take this as our best model. This is our best penalty. I will copy and paste that. I have a space for it here in the notebook. And I will also copy and paste the parameters. Um, and paste those in too. Oh. No quotes required. Congratulations, Rodrigo. Your model will now be immortalized in this video forever. Um, uh, so, okay. Master model. And now we can look at what how good this model really is. So this will just do the same data model residual plot that I showed you before. Um, Okay, so here's the data, here's the model, this is the residual, and it does look really good. I mean, yes, there are some details that it's not fitting. Um, there are some there's an area of higher misfit here, um, maybe down here. But overall it's it's doing really well. And of course, we wouldn't necessarily expect that this model is going to be a perfect fit to the data because it's only fitting one rectangle to the whole dis to one rectangular fault to the whole dis whole displacement pattern and probably the the cause of this misfit here is that there are areas on the fault that had more slip than the average um and you can make a more complicated model that incorporated that information uh, created incorporated, incorporated more complexity and you could fit the data better but for a single a single rectangle. This is a really good model. So congratulations, everyone. Um, we have done well. Uh, so what's Oz asking here? Is it better to start off with a lower starting penalty and then run the improvement model? It's best to start with a very big starting penalty. So the starting, well, uh, what are you referring to exactly? Uh, I, I guess there are a couple of things it could be. Um, so in this, in this optimization thing, I, I, I have my best penalty function at the start is a really stupidly large number, uh, so that hopefully the first, <laughs> first time you run it, you get a better penalty than that. Uh, and then it's just going to compare that, that improved penalty to other ones. If I actually run this, you'll see, uh, what goes on. So. You have to wait a while because it's going to run a card lots and lots and lots of times. Um, and it will output an, uh, the run number, the penalty for that run, and, and the best penalty so far. Okay, so run zero. Penalty is already really good. <laughs> um, maybe that... Maybe it won't improve much. Your your mileage may vary. Uh, you might not get a model as good as this straight up. But yes, it will take a while. Um, yeah, you see, the second time it ran, it got a, a worse penalty than the first time, so it's not going to improve. Anyway, this will chug along for a long time. Um, I don't have anything more to share with you, but I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Maybe I can stop sharing at this point. Uh, is show... there... Sorry. Sorry. Could you show the parameters in the quadri decomposition? Sure. Yeah. Okay. We can we can play around with that now. Um so what they are 
there's there's um I think there's four of them. This is the variance threshold. So um if you make this smaller, then it, it will divide the stuff up more um because it's trying to find a lower average variance. Um this is the number of nans, the not a number pixels allowed in any given cell. Um you can see that basically things that don't plot with with colors are, are are basically not not a number in this data set. So some of these areas, if you had a cell that was entirely within one of one of these lakes, say, uh, and it had more than half of its pixels being nans, it would ignore that cell. That's what that means. Um, then these are the the largest and smallest um, cells that you are allowed um in degrees so between 0.2 degrees and 0 0.01 degrees that's your range of of sizes so this this works out at about 20 kilometers and this would be about one kilometer but you I can one change more question uh, a little bit further when you were setting up the the crop scene crop bounds um yep. have you changed the, those defaults i have not changed them because if I wanted to crop it at 3000 pixels okay, down, I'm getting this is a crazy result going through that. It should be zero, what minus one, zero, minus one. If you change, if you wanted to crop this, you could put in say 3000. Okay. And Let me share my screen and show what's going on. Whoop. Oh. Okay. I will just show you what this does okay. when you like cut it off. Yeah. Um, then maybe you can explain what just happened. Maybe it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, so using the defaults, I'm getting this kind of shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, mm. Where's no, the... I didn't change anything. Maybe I missed you change something somewhere. I might have to go back and check my notebook. I, that's why I only only ran it um, with this. It's just the default. I'm getting this, and then the number of leaves is 54, and it's just well, like... Well, that part there's I can... There's a tiny one, and then I'm getting this. Well, this is far different from smaller area than you were further working at. Yeah, let this me part. find... Let me go back and consult my... I have a development version of this, which probably okay. is better, better than this Sorry version. Sorry for going back to the beginning but i don't know what's, what's really going on with this yeah maybe if you start from the beginning and reload everything it's set okay. them to zero <laughs> you can i can see if i can debug it in the meantime yeah we can come back to this during the office hours absolutely yeah i mean uh we are out of time anyway i think I have successfully cropped into Virograms doing this, so that's, that's the bit that's that's vexing me slightly here. But maybe this is a chimera of of several notebooks that I have used. But yes, if you set it all to zero, you get something that looks like this, and this looks right. I was going to say if you if you if you make the the threshold smaller, you should get more leaves. For example, five hundred now, not not one hundred ninety four. Um, because now the the maximum block size is smaller, so it's going to divide stuff up. Well, it's going to it's going to be more sensitive to to, to changes. So you can see it's the, there's a lot more small pixels in there now, and this should give you a very similar answer probably when you run it through the um, through the the modeling notebook. One thing to be aware of though is that um, the misfit is also a function of the number of pixels that you have, <laughs> so. Uh, it's not possible to directly compare the misfit value from one sample, one set of samples to another, um, because um, yeah, this will have more 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 samples, and so the total penalty will be larger, probably. Anyway, time is up. I realized I was just talking and you couldn't see what I was pointing at. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you run it with a a, 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 a 
threshold of a variance threshold of 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.02, you have a lot more samples. There's 500 points. Now, not not um, not 200. Anyway, I see Hiresh is here, so we should either let him talk or let him prepare. Hi, Gerard. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? I am exhausted from all that talking. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting your, your part, as always. So can I um, try to see if I can share? I know that you guys had a break in the agenda. So do you want to, what, what, uh, what's your plan? I am just testing for one second and let's, and then I'll stop sharing. You see we my screen. Skip, right? We can skip the break here because I know you probably have other things you have to do today. <laughs> Surprisingly, Eric, I have a light uh, afternoon. I cannot believe oh, it. Oh, wow. Well, no, don't tell anybody here that. <laughs> it's a big jinx <laughs> right there. <laughs> I was like, I was looking at it and I was like, is that my calendar? Doesn't look like it. <laughs> so maybe, okay. um, maybe yeah. we, we can proceed um, with with your your presentation um but before you start talking maybe introduce yourself and if you want to turn your camera on absolutely uh hello everyone uh, my name is Harish Fatahi I'm at JPL um working on NISAR mainly and uh, recently on uh, Opera project as well um I used to be more active on this course, um, one of my favorite courses. Uh, but yeah, as we are getting close to launch for NISAR, uh, sorry that I haven't been that active, but I'm sure you guys have been in good uh, good hands with this great team, Garrett, Franz, Eric, and rest of the team, really, and has joined Rowena, I saw. So uh, um, yeah, is that enough, Garrett? That's great. <laughs> Okay. And do you see my slides fine? Yes. All right. So um, changing the gear from uh, from um, modeling and all those excitement, uh, now back to INSAR and specifically INSAR time series analysis. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the theory and some overview of the algorithms that we have for INSAR time series analysis and um, on... Uh, Later, I believe on Friday, Yunjun is going to talk about the uh, MintPy and basically sharing some of these algorithms with Jupyter Notebooks and running some data. Um, so today is going to be just some slides. And uh, the slides that I'm going to show have changed compared to what is in the repository. I promise that sometime uh, today I will push the updates into the uh, repository so you will you will have access to these slides. So before I start, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues um, at JPL, Caltech, some of them are not there anymore, University of Miami, uh, that they have really contributed to a lot of this material I'm sharing today. Um, the outline for today is um, INSAR, just one slide, because I know by now you guys are all uh, INSAR experts. So um, Eric, Franz, Garrett, and the team, and have, have talked about INSAR, uh, I'll just have one slide and then I'll uh, talk about why, why we need to do time series analysis. Um, and then what are the main algorithms to do the INSAR time series analysis? Um, uh, specifically, I will talk about the PS time series and I will uh, talk about DS time series, two different main algorithms there, um, and then PS plus DS time series techniques. Uh, and then I'll touch on the uh, sources of errors, error analysis of inside displacement time series and a couple of different, uh, yeah, if, if we do everything, then what's the, what's the accuracy? What are the errors there uh, to get to our signal? So in SAR, I'm sure you all know, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, we have two SAR images um, specifically uh, for um, for our purpose, um, we are interested in the uh, repeat path in, uh, interferometry. So we have 
one platform, either an airborne or a, or a, or a, or a satellite. Um, we have the radar on, visiting the same area. And if the ground has moved, um, we would get an interfer ground that the phase difference basically representing uh, the displacement. Of course, there are more contributions to it. I'll get to it in a, in a, in a second. Um, um, but yeah, basically the measurement is the phase difference that we can convert to the range uh, change. By range, I mean the distance from the radar to the target on the ground. And um, that, that could be basically due to the displacement. But in reality, really, it's not only displacement. Um, we are propagating the uh, microwave signal from the radar through the atmosphere. So we have all those delays um, coming from the atmosphere. I'm sure there are uh, some, we have some uh, um, specific topics about the atmosphere, troposphere and ionosphere in this course. Um, uh, so that's that's one contribution to the interferometric phase that we get. And then there is contribution from the geometry, just because uh, the two um, the radar at two different acquisition times are not exactly at the same point in uh, in space. There is a baseline between them, and uh, yeah, of course we 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 know the geometry, and we have some some uh, digital elevation models on the ground, so we account for that interferometric phase. We take it out, but there are errors. The errors could be you know the orbit may not be very precise, even though these days they are, but also there are um, other environmental effects to compute this geometry correctly and the errors in the dim in themselves. Uh, so there may be some residuals in our interferograms. And then there are scattering properties of the of the scene may change over time. And that turned out actually to be to be a contribution to our interferometric phase as well. I will uh, touch on that on my last slide, but you know, just because of the moisture change, um, precipitation, that could raise to some signals in our interferograms. And yeah, the, the interferograms have also noise just due to the, the correlation. The scatterers are changing over time or just the system noise and all of that. Um, each of these components have um, different magnitudes in our interferograms. We have millimeter to centimeter ground displacements, actually could be tens of centimeters if we have big events like earthquake. But usually our interferograms are really dominated by atmosphere. In my opinion, 99% of our uh, interferograms, if we look at them globally, are just showing atmosphere. So tens to hundreds of centimeters, depending on wavelengths, depending on um, where we are um, on the planet and um, short wavelengths, ionosphere could be meters. Um, and then we have the geometrical residuals. Usually it's small these days for the satellites that we have uh, for, for displacement mapping because the orbital tube of these satellites, Sentinel-1 and upcoming NASA are very tight. So um, usually the residual due to the um, geometry in general is, is small. So we are talking about mainly millimeter max to centimeter level. And then, yeah, there is millimeter level contributions from just the scattering uh, properties, the electric changes of the scene. And noise, yeah, that's random numbers. If, if, if it's not too noisy, it could be just few degrees, but if you, know, you have full decorrelation, you, you will just get random numbers between minus pi and pi. Um, so in our purpose today, uh, the, the goal of the displacement time series analysis is to get to the signal and minimize the rest. Um, that takes me to uh, point out a couple of um, reasons why we really need to do the inside time series analysis. In my opinion, the, the first reason is um, to reduce the impact of the correlation. Um, so here is here is one uh, probably some uh, uh, one of, one of uh, examples that you may not see it all the time, but uh, in this case we have expand so that the correlates faster. Um, and if we just look at one interferogram over two point five years uh, somewhere in Bay Area, actually you you see all noise. But if we do time series analysis, a lot of this noise 
uh, kind of filters out and uh, that's the decorrelation noise and we get to more coherent same interferogram but more coherent so part of one reason to do the time series analysis is basically to reduce the impact of the noise over over long time the other reason is that as i showed basically we do have a lot of um, other interferometric phase contributions like um, atmosphere itself um, is the main one as i said even though we consider them noise but in space they are not random they are actually spatially correlated even though in time they may be random to some extent um, but in space they are spatially correlated so here is one example um, uh, from uh, yun jun's paper that if you look at one interferogram over Galapagos area, it's heavily affected by ionosphere, this specific one. Um, so it's really hard to see any ground displacement signals. Uh, um, colleagues who are familiar with, with, with um, ionosphere impacts, actually here we have even scintillation. So it's really what we see is, uh, is mainly ionosphere. But if we do time series analysis and get rid of a lot of these uh, um, systematic effects uh, and spatially correlated noise, um, then yeah, we get to um, we 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 look at the let's say here we have just fit uh, aligned to our time series and a lot of those random companies um, produce and of course we have correction for them as well, uh, but that's a different story. And at the end we get to the signal that we are interested in. So you see the all those volcanoes. Um, are actually very active in Galapagos and you see the displacement signals there. So basically the other reason is to just reduce the um, spatially correlated noise over time because usually they have, an, they have a random nature. And the other reason to do the time series analysis is to understand the temporal evolution of the ground displacement. Um, so the um, the good example probably is um, just through the earthquake cycle. We have the interseismic period where the ground is moving in time, is moving mainly linear. Uh, and then we have a co-seismic event, and then we have some post-seismic relaxation. So if we want to understand these geophysical events, we, we really need to look at time. Not only looking at space is not enough. Uh, there are other... Um, phenomena, volcanic activities, landslides, and all that, they have their own temporal evolution and understanding them really requires us to look at the time series analysis. All right, so with that introduction, I wanna jump into the uh, different techniques for doing the INSAR time series analysis. Um, um, and I wanna, um, basically categorize the techniques uh, for time series analysis based on the um, uh, types of scatterers on the ground. Um, you know that our resolution cells, I'm sure somewhere in the courses in the last few days, you guys have seen that our resolution cell is basically um, a collection of whatever scatterers exist in that cell. And uh, in general, we have two types that um, we have distributed scatterers where we have, you know, um, many uh, known of the scatterers are dominant. So somehow equally or almost equally are contributing to the return signal. Um, but we have other types of the um, um, scatterers where one one um, reflector, one scatterer within the resolution cell is very dominant. So it's contributing um, strongly to, to most of the return signal. Um, and that's what we call persistent scatterer or permanent scatterer. Um, so the in general, the interferometric phase of um, those PS pixels or permanent scatterers are, uh, are very precise through time. So if we look at the phase noise, if we could look at the phase noise of those scatterers, uh, they, would, they would look very stable over time. The noise would be very small. But in opposite, um, where if we would 
be able to look at the phase noise of the distributed scatterers over time, we would see that basically they are noisier than the PS pixels. And the reason for that is, you know, there is no dominant one and uh, each of these scatterers, if they are changing slightly over time, yeah, that's that means a different phase. And over time for us, we 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 just take one value over one pixel. So that, that means noise for us. So the PS, um, based on the type of scatterer, the, uh, uh, we have an algorithm called PS INSAR time series analysis, permanent scatterer time series analysis. This was suggested by Ferity et al. Uh, in two papers, 2000, 2001. Um, the idea is that uh, we have a stack of SLCs. So we, um, so far you have seen that you are making one interferogram, you need two SLCs, but now we are talking about time series analysis. So we, we need a stack of SLCs. And that stack of SLCs need to be aligned first. They need to be co-registered to the same grid. So we have a stack of co-registered SLCs. Um, the first step there is to identify PS pixels. I will I will talk about, um, I will go to a little bit more details about how, how to identify PS pixels. Once they have the PS pixels, then um, they uh, suggest to make single reference um, network of interferograms. Basically take one date as your reference date and make interferograms from all other dates relative to that reference date. Um, and of course, focusing on um, the uh, the PS pixels only that, uh, that they have been identified. And then unwrap those interferograms, uh, you get to the unwrap time series, which you can then, you know, take care of the uh, different components of the uh, interferometric phase, which we talked about, uh, uh, atmosphere and other dim errors and all that, that I will, I will uh, touch on those. But yeah, there are many different ways uh, how, to, how to reduce the noise there then. And unwrapping itself that I'm not going to talk about today is another world for for itself. Um, but yeah, um, I will I will go to more details of the PS selections. So in the original um, paper by Ferretti et al., um, um, they naturally talk about uh, what is PS, and the, as I said, PS is the pixels that have um, um, that have uh, that are very stable. The phase of those pixels are stable over time. In other words, the, the noise is low over time. But the problem is identifying those pixels just based on phase is not trivial. Uh, and the reason for that is the phase is dominated by other components of the interferometric phase, of the, of the phase in general, um, which is atmosphere is the main one. So just looking at the phase of the um, SLC pixel through time is not going to tell us if this is uh, immediately, it's not going to tell us if this is PS or not, because there is significant variation from known noise components. Noise here, I'm talking about the decorrelation and the SNR related noise. So they, they suggested that actually for high SNR pixels, we can look at the amplitude dispersion. Instead of looking at the phase, we look at the amplitude. And they demonstrated uh, analytically and also with simulation that if we have a stack of SLCs and if we look at the mean and standard deviation, so in this equation, this is mean and standard deviation of the amplitude of the same pixel, but through time, uh, we can um, get to the amplitude dispersion. So that tells us how, um, what's the dispersion of the amplitude over time which also is roughly the phase dispersion. So basically they got around the problem by looking at amplitude instead of phase. And here's a simulation that shows, demonstrated um, in their paper that actually, if that is true for high SNR pixels. So if we have high SNR, um, the amplitude dispersion and the phase dispersion, the two plots here are, uh, are pretty much identical. But when SNR, Produces, then that's a that's a that's a problem there. 
And that's how we got into other um, uh, series of papers and algorithms to identify PS pixels, and they wanted to go back to the face. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for that was uh, people wanted to look at the amplitude dispersion looks fine in urban areas or natural areas where we have strong reflectors, strong scatters, where we have buildings or we have you know, rocky mountains like Norway. Um, uh, but in, people wanted to look at other areas that um, and find PS over there as well, in vegetated areas or agricultural areas. Is there any PS we want to analyze it? So that, that gets us to the work by uh, um, Andy Hooper at all 2004, where they said, okay, if we just look at the amplitude dispersion, we, we don't really get much PS pixels, so we want to look back at noise, at phase noise directly. But the problem there, as I said, uh, the phase is dominated by other components. So you first need to get rid of them to get to the noise. Um, their approach uh, is that uh, while uh, most of these components, other components are spatially correlated, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in particular, the atmosphere and orbit, they are spatially correlated. Um, so we can just filter them out, some low pass filtering, and we will end up with them error and noise. They are um, high frequency. So we can estimate the them error part uh, because they are baseline dependent. So we will end up with some estimate of noise. And then from that, well, that's our residual, that's the noise, uh, the, uh, computing this uh, parameter called temporal coherence and thresholding it will give us an indication of the PS pixels. And they have in their algorithm, they have probably different versions and iterations and, and all that. But basically the idea is to get to the noise, to the phase noise. And that's not, that's not easy. And I'm sure there are other algorithms to do that, uh, including actually Piyush um, um, Agram and Howard Zipker had another paper, um, very similar to the Hooper's paper. The only difference is instead of empirically getting to the phase noise, they try to look at the, uh, the uh, theoretical um, um, uh, distribution of the uh, phase. And then uh, from there, they define this parameter gamma, which is related to the correlation. And if you look at gamma uh, as a function of uh, phase standard deviation, then they said, well, instead of um, looking at temporal coherence that way, we want to look at gamma. And how to get gamma? Well, we want to, uh, we, we look at the, we get back to the, uh, that phase noise that we talked about in the, in the previous slide. So we have the standard deviation of the phase noise. So we have from this plot, theoretically, we have the gamma and then come up with a threshold for gamma, and that would be your PS pixel. So very, very similar to the other one. And then more recently, um, our colleagues, um, um, Ann Chen uh, and, uh, and uh, her group, um, and is actually on the call, so she can correct me if I get this wrong, but I believe what they are doing is also after initial selection of the PS pixels, which is using the MLE approach from the previous slide, then they um, compute the uh, cosine of the phase similarity. So they look for similarity between those identified PS pixels and uh, to see, to throw out outliers. Um, and um, here is an example that if you have two predefined PS pixels based on previous algorithm, and then if they, if any of them is not really PS, the uh, cosine similarity, the phase and the cosine similarity would be on the left. But uh, if they are both PS pixels, um, uh, then uh, the uh, phase difference between them, since they are uh, uh, close to each other, is actually similar, uh, something like, like this plot here. And the similarity is high. So this way, they iteratively look at more pixels and uh, making sure that they are they are getting to the right PS pixels. And again, um, all these algorithms somehow touches, starts from the amplitude dispersion and tries to refine based on the phase and all that. Um, so how does uh, this, this look like for uh, real data? Here is one example. 
I just show examples for the amplitude dispersion here. Um, uh, you see the this optical imagery over Miami, North Miami Beach. Um, and then if we compute the amplitude dispersion from uh, uh, around 160 SLCs, and remember amplitude dispersion is simply the standard deviation over mean of the amplitude for the entire stack for each pixel, you get something like this map. So in this map, whatever um, is bright means that it had a uh, um, uh, larger dispersion, so that's not PS pixel. Whatever is dark is actually PS pixel or most likely PS pixel. Um, if we just simply threshold this one, um, we will get the um, PS pixels, PS candidates on the right side. Um, if we go through all the inside time series analysis chain, which I will talk about a little bit in more details, and at the end, uh, represent only here the PS pixels, you see that we have displacement time series rate um, over different PS pixels and actually identified some ground subsidence over North Miami Beach. But what I want to point out um, is look that mainly we have identified PS pixels over buildings, over the urban area. Look at the um, golf course here that basically pretty much we don't get um, any PS pixels. And that's because there is no strong reflector there. There is no building there. There is no big rock there. So basically we didn't find uh, much PS pixels. In, my, in our approach here, um, uh, those are mainly distributed scatter groups. So um, now I want to um, go to the other category of the INSAR displacement time series analysis, which is the distributed scatter time series analysis. Um, um, in these algorithms, we again start from a stack of co-registered SLCs, and uh, we, uh, with some magic of the time series analysis, we get to the displacement through time for each date relative to a reference date time and uh, uh, relative to a reference point. I just want to point that out because uh, you will see in the mint by um, exercise on Friday that uh, it is important to, 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 to be aware that where is your reference point and what is your reference date, that, that matters. And what we are doing with interferometry in general, we have a differential technique. So all these displacement time series at the end are gonna be relative, relative to a reference point, relative to a reference date time. So the, um, um, for, for doing the DS uh, time series analysis techniques, we are working with the DS pixels. And as I mentioned, they are usually noisier than the PS pixels. So that's why basically um, um, getting, um, getting reliable phase information from them requires some more work. Um, uh, traditionally, we just call it multi-looking, which is averaging a um, couple of pixels together in a window. And that window could be just you know, a rectangular window or no, we could get fancier and we could just do some analysis on the amplitude and determine which uh, pixel really is similar to the other pixels in the neighborhood based on amplitude or whatever other techniques uh, and do more, more um, adaptive multi-looking. But at the end, there is uh, all these DS-based techniques, they have some sort of multi-looking in them. Um, and um, the other thing that I want to point out is most of these techniques, um, you make interferograms and many of many interferograms because you have noise in the DS pixels. So you want to make a redundant network of interferograms. By network, what, what I'm showing here is I'm showing a plot of the time and perpendicular baseline. So each circle here is one acquisition time, basically the time that you have one SLC, and each line is one interferogram. So here, uh, um, the baseline is relative to the first date here, 
Um, actually, you will see that Mint by makes these plots for you. Aria Tools makes these plots for you. So you will you will see a lot of this. Um, but what one thing to notice is that it's a it's a redundant network. We have more interest programs than what than uh, than the number of acquisitions that are there. Um, two specific algorithms I want to talk about for DS time series analysis, and in my opinion, everything else on the DS falls on these two categories. Uh, one is the small baseline algorithms, originally known as SPAS type of algorithms, and the other one, full covariance based uh, algorithms. Um, uh, so I will I will get to the details of that. So first the um, SPAS algorithm, small baseline subset. Uh, originally, the subset was the reason at that time it was not possible to have this network fully connected. But from now on in my presentation, I assume you always have a connected network. And please make sure that you have a connected network when you are doing your own processing because discontinuity uh, is dangerous and could, could bias your, your results. But these days we have really enough data to have um, connectivity in our network, fully connected. But anyway, the same idea applies. Uh, it doesn't matter really. We have a network of interferograms. Uh, they are wrapped interferograms. We unwrap them. And um, then we, we get to a network of small baseline unwrapped interferograms. One thing that I uh, want to mention is in these SPAS algorithms, traditionally, the idea was to make small baseline interferograms. So that, if you look at here in this network, I'm not making, uh, I don't have an interferogram from the first acquisition to the last one. And the reason for that is usually those interferograms are very noisy. Um, and the reason for that is mainly temporal decorrelation. Um, so the, in this algorithm, um, the idea was, you know what, we, we just use small baseline interferograms and that they are more coherent. We have many of them and uh, we can unwrap them easily, at least more easily than the noisy ones. And then we invert them to get to that network of unwrapped phase relative to a reference date. So basically we are getting to a single reference network. And then of course you can do post-processing and uh, reducing atmosphere, estimating them errors or whatever other uh, corrections you wanna apply to, to isolate the actual displacement time series in your, in your time series. Um, how, how is it possible to do that? Um, in theory, well, you have uh, for each pixel, you have interferometric phase for your network. So basically you have a vector of interferometric phases. Um, um, and then you that interferometric phase, you can write the equation for each of them is phase of one SLC minus the phase of the other SLC. So basically you can have a design matrix that is all zero minus one, one, depending on where you are um, in time. And uh, you're, so your known vector is the vector of unwrapped interferometric phases on the left, and your unknown is the vector of uh, unwrapped phase time series relative to a reference date or time. Um, and um, of course, when it's done, you can uh, compute the residual of your, uh, how, how to solve this system. It's a linear system of equations. It's very easy to solve. Um, it, using any LP norm minimization, usually L1 or L2 norm. And um, um, what most people have done is L2 norm minimization because it's much faster. You can get more fancy and do weight uh, the vector of observations. So you do a weighted list squares. Actually, mint by uh, allows uh, different ways of weighting the design, uh, weighting your observation vector. One easy way is just, you know, you have a coherence matrix. So you have the standard deviation of the phase and that could be sort of your weight. Um, once you are done with your estimation, you can look at your residuals. 
for each pixel and compute this parameter called temporal coherence, something between uh, this parameter is somewhere between zero and one, and that represents the quality of the inversion. The quality of the inversion is mainly um, driven here by the quality of the interferometric phase uh, and the quality of the unlocking. So um, we will we will have more on that on the actual mint by presentation. So that's about the SPAS algorithm, uh, or and there are many flavors of SPAS. It has evolved. I said that it originally started from short baseline interferograms, but actually uh, the same group now they have even long temporal baseline interferograms for good reasons. Um, and yeah, different groups, many different flavors of SPAS. But the whole idea is around what I just mentioned in the previous slide. The other way of doing the DS time series analysis is through the full covariance uh, based algorithms. So this, this approach actually started from um, Guarnieri and Baldini. They are from a different community, not solid earth community. Um, um, but yeah, they proposed, well, we don't need to, ch to choose between the interferograms. We wanna use all possible pairs of interferograms. So we have a full covariance matrix. And um, th this matrix is basically, if you have n star images, then you have a matrix of n by n, and each element of that is one, uh, one interferogram, one multi-locked interferogram, actually. Um, so that's the elements. The, the magnitude of that is the, your um, um, uh, coherence magnitude. And if you normalize, you get the correlation matrix, basically. Uh, so the main thing here is that our network is a full network, is all possible interferometric phases, but we usually don't make them. We don't do the interfer. We don't make the interferograms traditionally. We make them on the fly. So we just get the stack of SLCs and we make all the possible pairs of interferograms on the fly for each neighborhood. Um, how to estimate the phase from here, the phase time series. There are different algorithms. The uh, one of the uh, algorithms is uh, basically uh, known as Squeezer algorithm, where um, there is an algorithm there in that paper by Ferretti et al. Um, uh, that um, basically proposes PTA. It's really building on Guarnieri and Cabaldini's work and coming up with an algorithm to estimate the uh, uh, maximizing the probability of the distribution function of the data using uh, an iterative optimization algorithm. Um, there are um, other algorithms to, to estimate the phase time series while you have the covariance matrix. An easy way is just um, compute the um, eigenvalue, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and pick the eigenvector uh, corresponding to the uh, largest eigenvalue, and that's your cleaned up phase through time. Basically, that's your wrapped phase time series. There are other algorithms like the um, EMI algorithm, which um, basically does not work directly with the covariance, complex covariance matrix, but works with the um, uh, uh, inverse of the coherence. Um, uh, times the uh, complex covariance matrix, and then look at the, and then compute the eigenvalue and eigenvectors. And this time choose the, the uh, eigenvector corresponding, corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue. And that would be your wrapped phase time series. There are many papers published um, on uh, quantifying the quality of these uh, different algorithms overall. I think um, the general conclusion is that maximum likelihood estimators and uh, like EMI estimator are, are good estimators. Um, uh, they are more precise than, for example, uh, just um, CED estimators. But there is one problem. The problem is that in this algorithm, either in PTA or in this one, we, are, we have to compute the uh, inverse of the coherence matrix. And that means that your matrix should be positive definite. 
but um, uh, numerically, it happens that the matrix is not positive definite. And then uh, you have to either give up or regularize your matrix, try to um, check if it's positive definite, estimate MLE. In, uh, in a recent paper, Sarah Mirzai, um, um, we suggest that actually is, is the leading author, Sarah Mirzai. We suggest that actually don't give up, just uh, regularize if you can estimate MLE. If not, go ahead and estimate fallback and CED. And that way you get a lot of more pixels and good, good estimates actually. So from a workflow point of view, um, this algorithm, how does it look like? We and the, and the top, I'm sharing the full covariance based algorithm for DS time series analysis. And in the bottom, I'm showing the small baseline algorithm just for comparison. If you wanna compare the two, uh, we are starting from the same stack of corregistral SLCs. In the full covariance matrix, we um, basically make a network of all possible interferon interferograms but remember on the fly for efficiency. And then we get to a time series of the wrapped phase, uh, which is a single uh, reference network, basically relative to a reference state. And then we unwrap that and we get to a time series of unwrapped phases. And from there, everything is similar to other uh, algorithms. You have to reduce troposphere, ionosphere, whatever you can do. Uh, but um, so as, as you may have noticed, um, uh, basically this getting, starting from the SLCs and getting to a time series of the wrapped phase, that's something that we did not have in the SPAS algorithm. So that's, that's, the main, that's the main difference, I would say. Um, so the full covariance-based algorithms um, um, it has been demonstrated that uh, several papers that actually they um, help um, with, with, with new sensors where we have a very small uh, temporal baseline between acquisitions, mm, having long temporal baseline interferograms and if possible, having all possible pairs of interferograms is very helpful to, um, to reduce the impact of scattering properties, dialectic changes, moisture changes in our interferometric phase. So there is a good reason to use the full covariance matrix if you can. But then the problem is that it's expensive. Um, we are at an era now that a lot of SAR data, Sentinel-1, we have regions with 300 plus acquisitions. Um, processing all possible pairs of interferograms is expensive. So there is a, there is a solution for that as well. Uh, Ansari et al, uh, 2017, they, they suggested that actually we could batch the covariance matrix to smaller batches and process each batch independently and go on. At the end, of course, we have to adjust the estimated dropped phase for each of those mini stacks and that is done by the use of what they call compressed SLC, uh, which is used to actually sort of make interferograms with the rest of the SLCs for each mini stack, and at the end to adjust the phase from different mini stacks. So there is an algorithm. If you want more details, just look at uh, Homan Sari's paper, 2017. I think I have it in my references. Very, very nice paper. Um, with that, I wanna uh, touch on the last part of the algorithm, which is really just the combination of the PS and DS. So um, in my opinion, um, this is probably the optimum solution where we have, we, we, we want both um, a good look at the PS pixels and, and uh, there are pixels, no doubt that there are DS pixels uh, and we don't wanna give up on them as well. With a little bit more to looking, we can get a very reliable phase. And with a full covariance matrix estimation, we can beat down a lot of um, biases. And uh, yeah, so we want both. Um, so the algorithm, of course, this is not new. 
uh, this Grisar paper is actually uh, this algorithm that you have the PS pixels and you have the flow of your PS time series analysis and you have the DS pixels and the, the, the flow of DS analysis and you can do combine two and get to the unwrapping and then the rest would remain the same. Um, and again, there are many different flavors of how to do the PS analysis part and how to do the DS analysis part. But I believe what I covered here are the general, um, um, generally covers most of the, most part of those algorithms, even though there could be different flavors. Um, some examples, um, a few years ago, we processed data over North, uh, California, uh, around Bay Area, where we have this fault called Concord Fault. Our colleague, uh, Katya Timofieva, actually was processing data here. And we see that um, here on the top, I'm showing the rate of the displacement from PS pixels only. And uh, in the bottom, we see the rate of the displacement from PS and DS pixels. So it's very interesting that the two are overall consistent of course, we generally have more pixels when we when we add DS pixels and uh, less pixels when we have only PS pixels. So that's the nice thing about combining PS and DS because that makes phase unwrapping much easier. If you look at different individual pixels, we see linear displacement, we see a, a seismic fault creep, uh, which is very interesting, Katya discovered. And we see a seasonal uh, uh, displacement uh, superimposed on the a seismic creep. Um, so all different um, uh, kind of uh, displacement signals are, are uh, identified in this case study. Another case study that we did again a few years ago, um, an earthquake close to where I was born. Um, and um, uh, this was in 2017 in Kurdistan. You see that we did the around 120 co-register SLCs, um, do the time series analysis with this PSDS analysis uh, approach. And uh, then at the end fit to that time series to estimate the co-seismic and also the post-seismic. As you see between these two pixels, you clearly see the co-seismic and you see the relaxation after the earthquake. Um, there is a good opportunity when you look at um, um, a full covariance matrix and the magnitude of that coherence, it um, the shows changes. Actually, Rowena Loman and um, her team have done a lot of work on understanding this full coherence matrix and using it for um, for change detection or uh, other or soil moisture estimation and all that. So there is a good good opportunity to look at the magnitude of the coherence itself. And it's in this example show it shows that how the after the earthquake the scattering properties have changed. So you see a very clear discontinuity there. All right. So hopefully this gives you an overview of most INSAR time series analysis algorithms. Um, in the next few slides, I wanna just touch base on, okay, what are the sources of the errors? And when we, when, when we say errors or noise, uh, it means that we are interested in displacement in, uh, today, even though most of those noise components could be signaled for somebody else, right? So, um, in all those algorithms, sort of, we have three main components in my opinion. We have the stack of co-register SLCs, and we have, at some point, we get to a time series of unwrapped phase, a time series of unwrapped phase, not the redundant network, but a single reference, no matter you do PSDS or PS plus DS, you sort of have that. And from there, that, that time series could have contributions from many different contributors like atmosphere, dim errors, orbit, whatever else, plus displacement. How to get to the quality, how to, how to minimize those contributions and get to the displacement, that's another, another part of your um, error budget, basically. So 
uh, I'll I'll talk about the uh, uh, co-registration. In all those algorithms, the intrinsic assumption is that you have aligned your stack of SLCs precisely. And when we say precisely, there is a definition for that. Analytically, you can um, there are equations that you can look it up, and um, here is here is a simulation that shows if we have co-registration errors on the uh, x-axis, um, how the phase noise would look like, and how the coherence magnitude or correlation looks like. Um, you see that if we have no co-registration errors, we have coherence one, and again this is only. Um, uh, coherence and phase noise due to the co-registration errors, so nothing else. If you have um, zero co-registration error, you you have no phase noise. Uh, but as you go along and co-registration error increases, then you lose coherence and your phase noise is going to increase. Uh, here is one real example. It's actually LS1 over Hawaii. It's in one of our street map. Uh, notebooks. I don't know if Eric has kept that one for this course, but uh, I hope it's familiar to you. So if we just, if we would have this much of misregistration in range and azimuth in pixels, basically around one pixel misregistration in range and around half a pixel in azimuth, we would get the interferogram at full resolution would be like noise. But if we refine that misregistration, you see that uh, the uh, the interferogram becomes more coherent. And this is not the best that we could do. We can do better, but this is just a demonstration. So yeah, a very, very evident that um, the, the first contribution is just, yeah, make sure your stack of SLCs is very well aligned. And uh, rule of thumb is that one tenth of a pixel because we are not really sensitive um, to more than one tenth of a pixel, in my opinion. So we, we kept that example that you uh, in the strip map app notebook. Oh, it's there still? OK, great. So yeah, it's the same thing. Thanks, Eric. And um, the other uh, source of error is the phase unwrapping. No matter what you do, um, uh, what, which algorithm at the end you have to unwrap. At, at some point you have to unwrap the phase. And any uh, wrong two pi jump, so what is unwrapping? You know by now that it's basically getting to that integer number of two pi's added to your wrapped phase to get rid of those discontinuities, yeah, to get to a smooth, smoother unwrapped phase to recover the cycles. And if any of those uh, interferograms in your network has errors, has wrong two pi jumps, it will show up, it propagates to your time series too. Here is a simulation that I did many years ago um, where you see we have a network and I added 10% um, unwrapping error to 10% of interferograms in that network. And it's a simulation, so I know what's my signal. It's the green line, dashed line. If I have no unwrapping errors, I would get the block um, um, squares. So basically that demonstration that uh, the inversion is working. But if I have 10% unwrapping errors, I would get the circles. Um, and then if I have 20% of Unwrapping errors, it's getting worse, more scattered. If I have 50% of unwrapping errors, um, it's getting even um, more uh, uh, scattered. So um, the um, there are ways to deal with phase unwrapping errors to some extent, and the Yunjun is going to talk about it on Friday. Uh, one way is to look at the phase closure and try to estimate unwrapping errors if you have uh, a dense network of interferograms. And actually, that's what it is going on here. Basically, the block squares are after unwrapping error corrections. But as you see, when we have a lot of unwrapping errors, then the algorithm is not performing well. So having a good network of mainly correctly unwrapped is just the key to get to the reliable um, uh, estimate of the time series. 
and the network matters. I talked about for um, SPAS algorithms, but even for full covariance-based algorithms, once you have the wrapped phase time series, you have to unwrap. And you have a choice of unwrapping just a single reference interferograms or unwrapping a Delaunay network or unwrapping annual mini stacks, mini stacks, I'm sorry, or sequential one connection. Um, so this is like making only nearest neighbor interferograms to unwrap after whatever you have done with your inversion of the wrapped phase time series. And then sequential or uh, with three connections, three nearest neighbor or um, um, uh, basically eight connection um, sequential. So as you see in this example, um, it's the same input, same wrapped phase time series, but different networks for unwrapping. Sarah Mirzai's paper has this figure and very well explained. Um, it turned out that actually single reference is, is safer. And the reason for that is if we have one interferogram affected by unwrapping error, it will stay there. It's not going to propagate to others. And that's really nice. The problem with uh, the, the most dangerous one is the sequential one connection. Because if you have unwrapping error somewhere in the middle, it's going to it's gonna propagate to all other acquisitions after this one. So this is this is good lesson, really. And if you have a denser network, in general, it's it's good because the contribution of that one or few interferograms with unwrapping errors are going to be minimized. Uh, so yeah, they, those who are familiar they, they with, with, with the topic and insert and insert time series analysis, I'm sure many of you on the call, uh, they, you would immediately recognize that these are unwrapping errors. While that feature doesn't exist in, especially in uh, Delaunay single reference or dense networks, but to some extent actually um, exists in this one too. So the network matters. And then the other contribution is the DEM error. It used to be a bigger problem for us with old sensors. Well, it's a big problem if you use old sensors still. Somebody may, may want to. There are good information there. Um, then uh, it's a function. So the idea is that uh, our interferometric phase, as I said, and I'm sure Eric and uh, Tim have talked about last few days, the interferometric phase is, has contribution from the topography because of the baseline separation. And we use a DEM and the knowledge of the orbit to, to simulate the phase and remove it from our interferograms. But that DEM could have error. So if the DEM has error, um, depending on your baseline, that error propagates all the way to your time series. But the good thing is it's a function of baseline, error, uh, baseline and you know your baseline and you know your baseline time series, so uh, and you can estimate it. Here is um, one example from NVSET um, data set um, that if we wouldn't estimate the DEM error, you see that we get those block circles before DEM error correction, and after uh, uh, after correcting for DEM error, then we get the triangles, which nicely represents this. Uh, of volcanic activity in Galapagos. Um, uh, and uh, here is a zoom in for this part that shows that the time series before correction is very well correlated with the baseline time series. But again, for modern, for modern sensors, for newer sensors like Sentinel-1 and NISAR, we have a, a tight orbital tube uh, of around 500 meters, so basically, the contributions of the, so the baseline is small, even if there is DEM error, the contribution is smaller than what uh, used to be for other sensors. And yeah, atmosphere, I'm sure um, the team have talked about atmosphere or they will, I don't, uh, <laughs> I didn't keep track of the schedule, sorry. But yeah, if, if you don't correct atmosphere or if they, even if you correct, there are some residuals, they will propagate to your INSAR time series as well. Um, here is one example, just proof of concept that on NVSAT we had radar, and at the same time, on the same platform, we had MERIS, an optical uh, instrument that would uh, give you width delay of the atmosphere. So these two are completely independent, but uh, 
you see that our insert pretty much was showing uh, tropospheric delay due, due to the width delay changes between the two acquisition times. And this is the residual. Of course, there are atmospheric models and tons of papers and different models that uh, we try to reduce the noise as much as we can. Here is a dramatic improvement, but don't expect <laughs> to get this actually all the time. You would rarely get this because I was looking at, in this example, I was looking at two pixels very far along and very far apart and uh, very with high topographic variation. So the impact of the troposphere was high and the elevation change was high. So the atmospheric model was working nicely in this case. And you see that if I don't correct for the troposphere, I would get this noisy one. After correcting, I get uh, the noise significantly reducing the time series. And ionosphere, it's, um, it's, it's the other part of the atmosphere um, uh, that we have, uh, again, I think uh, Eric is probably talk about, is gonna talk about that, but he has already. Um, it's gonna be a bigger problem for uh, uh, smaller, for longer wavelengths, uh, smaller frequencies like L band for NISAR, but good thing that we can, we have an algorithm to take care of the atmospheric delay as well. Um, but if we, if we wouldn't, this is how it would look like in your time series. In the background, there is GPS for comparison, uh, the block circles. And your insert, our insert time series, if we don't correct for ionosphere, is yellow. <laughs> and uh, when we correct for ionosphere using split spectrum technique, we get to the green, which matches really nicely with the GPS. And uh, the same for this other example, two different stations somewhere in, uh, in South America. Uh, the last part of the error budget that I just want to quickly touch on is the closure phase. So um, closure phase, uh, what, what is it? Basically, if you have three acquisitions, I, J, K, you can always make three interferograms between the three acquisitions, one between IJ, one between JK, and one between K and R going back. And if you sum them up, you would expect that's called closure phase, a triplet, and you would expect that to be zero because it's a closed loop. And it is zero for single lock interferograms, but for multi locked interferograms, it is not. In many cases, it is not. So that has started the new discussions in the community um, that multi-looking gives rise to non-closing triplets. And if you don't, if you if you don't take care of it for displacement time series, it has a bias, but uh, which is really minimized when you use full covariance matrix algorithms. In a, in a paper, um, my colleague Yuji Zheng um, led the paper. We have demonstrated that actually it's the spatial and temporal inhomogeneity of the scene that is um, causing the non-closing triplets. Others in the community have, of course, worked on this. And here is one example from the paper that you see, uh, it's a dry lake um, somewhere in Mojave Desert that uh, if we do a time series analysis using only one nearest neighbor interferograms and um, uh, look at the rate of the estimated displacement time series, we would get this figure. If we use the same, but instead use five nearest neighbor interferograms, we would get this one. And uh, if we use more interferograms, we would get this one. If we use all possible pairs of interferograms, we use this one. We, 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 we get this one. So note that this bias is gone. Um, uh, basically, whatever we were seeing around this lake, especially look at this part, is, is called bias. And it was really reported by Ansari et al. in a paper 2020, 21, I guess, um, that we have also confirmed. We have uh, suggested one algorithm for correcting the SPAS in Yuji's paper. Uh, Yunjun is going to talk about that in the MintPy. Um, uh, presentation on Friday. And here is just uh, one example of where that is coming from. Um, the bias 
is uh, most likely coming from the moisture changes. Here I'm showing the bias over time, which is the, uh, the block circles. And the gray shows the cumulative precipitation. And you see that they are really correlated very nicely. And of course, if you look at the coherence, Rowena Lohman and colleagues have done uh, a lot of work on the coherence and um, the changes of, uh, changes of the coherence due to the, um, uh, due to the precipitation and moisture changes, which is also represented here. But uh, the, the, the phase, which was our main uh, uh, focus here, yeah, that's um, uh, also nicely is represented here by this uh, uh, bias and correlated with the precipitation. All right, so some references, I will try to upload these um, slides as soon as I can and uh, complete the references, but yes, you can you can dig into these details. This could be a course by itself. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, and the tools, a lot of tools you have been exposed to ICE2. Uh, ICE3 has been heavily under development by um, our main supporter has been NICER so far. Other projects are kicking in. Hopefully sometime soon in future, we will have this course Built on uh, ice three as well. Uh, MintPy, Yunjun is going to talk about that's for the time series analysis. Uh, Fringe is for the full covariance based uh, time series analysis. My Apple Pie from Sarah Mirzai and team from University of Miami. Sarah is also now with us at JPL. Um, that's also for full covariance based analysis. So a lot of lot of open source tools available to you. Thank you, and I'll stop here. And let me know if you have questions. All right, get it. Um, Eric, I'm done. Is it? So th there are, there's a Q&A okay. button, and there are a couple of, well, there's a question there. Um, there is also questions appearing in the chat. All right, so let me get to all that then. Yeah, it'd be easier to see if you stop sharing. Yes, exactly. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Kong had a series of questions earlier about how you calculate phase noise. Yeah, so that was, um, uh, let's me go there. So how do you calculate the phase noise? That's exactly the problem. How do you do that? So the original paper from Ferretti, they said, well, that's not possible. We just look at the amplitude, which represents the phase noise. But then that's the whole other group of papers that they try to get to the phase noise because it's not easy phase is dominated by atmosphere mainly and other contributions. Everything is usually larger than noise. So you have to really <laughs> do your best to get to get there. And that's uh that's challenging. So no no easy way to get there done. Um okay so sorry too many let me uh where do you suggest I start? So yeah, is there an open source PS based INSAR software? Yes, Rowena said stamps. There are others as well. Fringe is there. Uh, we are uh, my Apple Pie, as I showed. Uh, those are in house, so you will get support from <laughs> our teams. Um, and we are working on another one for Opera project. So hopefully we will that will be the one to go forward. But yeah, a couple of them are out there already. What is the single look interferogram and multi-look interferogram? I hope that is clear. Thanks, Corina. Uh, how could I convert GPS displacement to line upside displacement in order to compare GPS and time series? Good question. So I don't know if somewhere in the course we have that, but basically you need the uh, unit vectors. Um, from uh, ground to the target uh, for your line of sight vector. So you, you're, whatever we are measuring is the line of sight, as you know, 
uh, but for each target, we could compute uh, what's the unit vector in um, uh, basically a vector with components in east, north, up. And if you have your time set, GPS, then you can just uh, multiply that unit vector to east, north, up and get your line outside. The unit vector could be also computed from the um, azimuth angle of your line offset vector and your incidence angle. So as, as soon as you get your unit vector of the line offset vector, you are fine. You can do that. And we totally uh, talked about that this morning. <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> um, so reference points should be based on the high coherence of the only reference image. No, not really. Um, um, that needs to be, that's tricky. I hope Yunjun with real data will talk about that as well. But yeah, you need, ideally, you need a point that is coherent over time. Um, and also, in terms of phase unwrapping, you want that point to be in an area that most of your other points also are coherent relative to it. So you, you have less unwrapping errors. So yeah, getting to a good reference point is, uh, is some work there. But yeah, the short answer, you want that point to be coherent over time. Um, what strategies might be most efficient in mitigating tropospheric topography delay? I assume you want, you mean tropospheric delay. So there are two things, topographic residuals, which is the TEM error, and tropospheric delay. Tropospheric delay uh, could be uh, well correlated with topography. So uh, let's distinguish between the two. Uh, for land size or subsidence monitoring in the Himalayas, could you please share your insights on this matter? Oh my God, that's uh, a <laughs> difficult questions. So I think we, we, we are not done with troposphere, right? There is no magic. There is no magic uh, to do that right now, unfortunately. There are all different atmospheric models that you can try out there, um, era five was there for a long time. So there are, I assume enough papers that would give you some idea, but, but yeah, none of them are gonna completely remove or give you the uh, one answer. So you have to really try. Um, um, lately, we have had analysis on the NYSAR project, uh, David Beckert and team, um, in, um, um, Eric, I think, was involved too. That yeah, the suggestion to us on the NYSAR project was by the by the NYSAR science team. They suggested high res, um, high res ECMWF forecast models. Um, so you could you could explore that as well. But yeah, unfortunately, no no magic there. You have to uh, play with different models. Um, so shall I go to the answered one? Garrett, now there was some questions about uh, again. Kang had a question about um, the the, the wh whether the unwrapping was done in time or space or a combination of the two when doing PS. I think there are many different algorithms. I am so sorry. I was telling my colleague Scott Stanley this morning that that's the part that I am lacking on my slides, and I really didn't have time for it because that's an interesting topic and needs, needs, needs work to put something good together. But yeah, the short answer is there are many different ways for unwrapping PS and also DS. I mean, when in my opinion, when you get to the, um, you wrapped phase time series, I don't care if you have done SPAS or, or, or whatever uh, full covariance matrix for DS or uh, PS, once you have a network of single reference wrapped phase time series, Regardless, regardless of PS or DS, yeah, then over there, yeah, there are all those different algorithms. Now how to unwrap the difficult part. And yes, there is usually PS, PS algorithms. Usually they do some time domain uh, unwrapping. Um, and usually the espas like algorithms have done more uh, 2D unwrapping and then invert the network of the um, unwrapped interferograms. But yeah, there are many different ways to do this. Um, is there, I see many of them have been answered. 
but uh, let me know if um, it's I, I suspect that w we have covered most of the questions. Okay. Of course, there's the Slack channel. If anybody has any further questions, we could use that. I, I also think we're a little behind schedule. Yes. But that's not a problem. We could take a short break and then Sim is next up to talk about ARIA tools. All Thanks, right. Suresh. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see Thanks, you. Thanks, Arash. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, everyone. So I propose uh, a five-minute break to one thirty-five Pacific time, uh, and we will re re reassemble to talk about ARIA tools. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome to the to the to the stage. Sim Ransanga. Um, Sim, would you like to introduce yourself before you launch into your uh, your presentation and demo? Oh, sorry. I just realized I was not I was unmuted. But yeah, of course. Um, so uh, first of all, could everyone hear me? Um, Absolutely. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you that I haven't uh, met yet or virtually met, uh, my name is Simran Sangha, but you could call me Sim. I'm an engineer at JPL that has worked with David Beckert and Marin and Brett here, who are also, of course, assistants to develop the ARIA tools package that uh, we'll be playing around with today. So um, that's my quick little intro. But, um, but before I sort of jump into it, um, is there anything else you want to add, Gareth? Or, or no, take it away. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah, first and foremost, before I go too far, just this looks good in everyone's everyone's end. The um, slideshow is not too squished or so. Um, just want to make I, sure that looks good. I can read it. Okay, cool, cool. Great. Yeah, so um, let's get started then. Um, so um, again, special shout out to Marin and Brett, um, along with uh, Robert Zinke of JPL for vetting and cutting this year's release of ARIA Tools. Okay, so um, yeah, as we go along, please do feel free as appropriate to direct your questions in the chat or so. And if you do wish to interrupt and ask questions, that's fine as well. But if you do attempt to ask me something and I don't respond, it's likely because I didn't hear you. I'm not necessarily ignoring you. So please, uh, to the other instructors here, I guess more directly to them, please feel free to either Slack or maybe even text me. I've got my phone here as well, um, but yeah. Also, please do let me know if there are bandwidth issues or glitches on my part that I'm not conscious of, and I'll try to make some adjustments on it in my end. In other words, I'll just turn off my video and just hope that works. Um, so anyway, uh, today we're going to be going over a brief overview of ARIA standard products and how we may use ARIA tools to manage, visualize, and manipulate them, and also get them ready for time series analysis through Mint's PY, as Yunjin will be discussing in more detail later um, for that focus uh, mint py sections but uh, before i get into that i think it's as appropriate time as any to give a background on aria in the aria standard product itself and that's what this little slide deck is that i uh, prepared so um it's going to be again a high level overview of the ongoing development and production efforts under aria what aria is to begin with i'll transition to an intro on the aria tool software itself and then end off on a preview of the opera project before we transition into the main uh, tutorial uh, content. I'd also like the time to uh, take the time here to acknowledge the efforts of many others I've worked closely with in the ARIA team, including, but obviously not limited to, Grace Bato, David Becker, Marin Govorsen, Charlie Mershock, Emre Havisley, Brett Buzanga, Joe Kennedy, Andrew Johnson, and many more. So, uh, okay. To start off with, I should provide a formal introduction of the data and methods of relevance here and what ARIA is to begin with. So um, for decades, disaster response efforts and regulations were at best informed by relatively limited conventional methods involving in situ measurements, if even available or obtainable to begin with. Um, specifically, GPS has and continues to be concentrated and limited to certain areas in developed high population centers, such as Southern California and Japan, while 
population centers and especially remote and or even underdeveloped regions have relative dearth of such infrastructure. Thus, space-based geodetic measurement imaging techniques have become critical additions to our tool set for understanding natural hazards, especially through the past decade with improvements to competing infrastructure and the proliferation of active satellites, as I'll briefly show. Um, geodetic imaging's uh, unique ability to capture surface deformation with high spatial and temporal resolution nearly anywhere in the world has revolutionized geosciences. However, analysis of these data sets is typically handcrafted following each event and are not generally uh, generated rapidly and reliably enough for a response to natural disasters. So that's as good of a segue as any to ARIA. The ARIA project is, stands for ARIA uh, Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis, and it's a joint effort of Caltech and JPL that brings geodetic imaging capabilities to an operational level in support of local, national, and uh, international hazard science and response communities. Specifically, ARIA has developed and is maintaining the infrastructure to generate imaging products. These include science and urgent response products in near real time that can improve situational awareness for disaster response. So ARIA is a, also developing the automated imaging analysis capabilities necessary to keep up with the increase in raw data from geodetic imaging missions planned for launch by NASA, as well as uh, international space agencies. So uh, the JPL institutional leads include David Beckert and Eric Fielding with the, relative, uh, the relevant uh, contact information uh, thereafter pasted. So um, let me first lead off with an overview of the urgent response products of, uh, under the ARIA umbrella. So urgent response products are change detection maps that leverage coherence or amplitude measurements derived from SAR data. So in this context, coherence refers to essentially the stability or reliability of the phase information of a given target pixel between two images. And amplitude refers to the strength of the radar response. So um, uh, within the sort of sub umbrella of the urgent response suite itself are two distinct um, products that are named based off of their focus applications, namely the damage proxy maps and the flood proxy maps, which track coherence and amplitude respectively. So specifically damage proxy maps are intended to serve as guides to identify damaged areas while flood maps are intended to illustrate areas of likely and ongoing flooding and thus serve as disaster response guides. So let me just give some synopsis on these specific case study applications themselves. So again, on the left is the DPM, the damage proxy map, which is created in response to this Midwest US tornado outbreak in December 10th, 2021. So this product is used to help identify buildings and infrastructure damaged from a series of tornadoes that hit several of these Midwestern states. And in this particular inset is Bowling Green, Kentucky. Note that the color variation from yellow to red indicates increasing level of surface change and therefore is proportional to likely damage. And then on the right is the flood proxy map, the FPM, which is created in response to a major tropical storm which affected parts of Vietnam and Laos in June, 2021. An image acquired before the storm hit land and another image acquired in the middle of the storm were used to compute this map. So the areas in blue indicate areas that are or are likely to have been affected with flooding as the storm continues. Um, typically, flooding results in amplitude decrease due to the specular surface of uh, open waters as less signal is backscattered back to the radar instrument. So this is how the flooded areas are being highlighted. Okay, so with all that, um, I'll transition over to sort of the main focus of this session per se, which are the ARIA science products, which encompass the suite of interferometric products used to measure surface deformation. But again, as another little preface, I should emphasize the proliferation of SAR systems. In particular, there are two ongoing uh, radar missions providing uh, open access to our data going back until 2014, namely uh, JAXA's ALOS-2 and ESA's Sentinel-1 constellation. Both offer a dense archive of data that serves as a bit of, big of a big data conundrum. So uh, uh, for instance, the Sentinel-1 constellation offers repeat past data with global revisit times of around six to 24 days. Also each individual frame of data is around two to four gigabytes in size. And together with intermediate products involved in the intermetric processing, 
Generating a single interferometric product involves the creation of tens of gigabytes of data and may take several hours. All of this for a single interferogram over a single frame. And for reference, uh, through our own uh, analysis, uh, independent analysis of a single frame footprint over LA, we've had to process just around, uh, I think, 6,000 uh, products um, going back until 2014 in order to accurately constrain the surface deformation and reduce sources of noise. So um, just to drive this point uh, home further, additional SAR satellites from JAXA and ESA respectively are planned to launch soon, along with our own NICER mission, which by some estimates is expected to collect 24 terabits of raw data per day, which honestly, I can't even begin to imagine or fathom. I, I don't even know how to visualize that uh, level of output. So. Um, that said, in this big data regime, under the Getting Ready for NICER project at JPL, and in collaboration with the ASF, we developed a standardized interferometric product that is guided by a file structure as is planned for the NICER mission itself. So since around 2018, the ARIA product, uh, project has facilitated the generation of these standardized interferometric products. Um, though they are colloquially referred to as ARIA products, that's what I'll be um, referring to them as we go along. They are officially named as ARIA GUNW products, uh, G U N W, where GUNW stands for Geocoded Unwrapped U UNW Interferogram, as they are standardized products processed on a frame by frame basis. And this analysis ready data set includes uh, science raster and metadata layers, which cumulatively take up only around 50 megabytes of space. Um, and uh, ARIA products have been automatically generated from the cent uh, from Sentinel-1 SAR data by leveraging open source processing software and are distributed to an open access distributed archive center or DAC such that they are available to the community to experiment uh, with and get familiar with how sort of nice SAR data may look like. And I'm going to kind of just briefly elaborate on some of the mechanics behind the processing pipeline developments also next. But before I do that, sort of the background of ARIA and ARIA products. So are there any sort of initial questions or concerns? Okay. Um, if not, yeah, let's sort of jump on to the next half. So I'll start off by providing a high level overview of our cloud processing pipeline that we've been working to establish and maintain over the past couple of years. I should also note that this work here has been carried out under a NASA access funded effort led by PI David Becker. So our starting point of reference is our enhanced cloud hosted DAC API. So this interface provides developers in the community like easy access to our data holding. So, you know, why, why do we care? What, what's the point of this? So what, what does enhancements refer to? So enhancement refers to the established features to support the querying and bulk download of interferometric products of a specified spatial temporal extent and also compatibility with software used for post-processing time series analysis. Um, and in an effort to manage costs more efficiently and make production easier, more transparent and uh, uh, straightforward to manage and access for the team and community, we have ported over the production generation tools to this open source hybrid pluggable processing pipeline. Short uh, hype is what it stands for. It, this, Hype cloud architecture to allow our team to generate ARIA products through the cloud hosted DAC API. So these tools enable other science, uh, science teams the ability to redeploy the same architectures and containerized processing software for their own study areas. And our cloud processing unit leverages the open source in ICE2 software to produce the interferometric products and stores them into our public Amazon simple stored service, the S3 buckets. Um, and uh, yeah, from here, the products are ingested into the NASA Common Metadata, Metadata Repository or CMR. And as per the name, the CMR provides a means to more easily and transparently manage product metadata and access data. And from the CMR, the products are then delivered to the open access ASF DAC, the latter which ensures uh, the ARIA products are available to the public for reproducible scientific analysis and disaster monitoring. And finally, this portion of the post-processing pipeline has uh, demonstrated to the community through uh, a series of annual training courses posted on YouTube. So I'm kind of breaking the fourth wall here. And uh, uh, this also involves demonstration through freely available Jupyter notebooks. 
Okay, so next I just wanted to briefly summarize some relevant current ongoing development efforts, specifically a GunW archive update to accommodate correction layers, which we hope to update the community on shortly as we gear up for production and the ideas maybe depending on what happens next year, this will be what we also cover in more detail in potential training courses. But anyway, there are well-known and documented sources of significant noise and interferometry associated with the travel path of radar waves through the atmosphere from the satellite and to the ground and back. Namely, you've got tropospheric water vapor as Rush was uh, talking about, and then the spatial temporal variations of the ionosphere's total electron content, or TEC, which are known to influence radar signal in a way that may severely obscure surface deformation signal of interest. And to round out this source of noise, we have the motion of the Earth's surface that is driven by the gravitational pull from the sun and the moon. Um, in other words, a solid Earth tide motion. And this motion may vary slowly over space, but fast in time, such as large gradients may be introduced across a single star acquisition itself. So for our solid Earth tides implementation, we build off of an existing established software called PySolid. And for our tropospheric water uh, vapor implementation, we build off the radar package, which I believe Brett had shared in the chat. And um, to successfully integrate these layers, we are working to optimize the ancillary correction algorithms through the cloud and validate the generated correction layers. And again, this is an effort um, together with uh, Marin, uh, Brett, Charlie, and uh, David, among others, that are working really hard to get this out, um, even, I guess, technically as we speak to in the background. But uh, anyway, um, before I transition to the notebooks themselves, let me end off on an overview of the OPERA project, where OPERA stands for Observational Products for End Users for Remote Sensing Analysis. So for some background, it was a request to NASA from the Satellite Needs Working Group, short for SNWG, for remote sensing needs. That was the motivation behind this project and its proposed products. So specifically the relevance here is a 2018 SNWG cycle through which JPL was requested by NASA to do a formulation activity for three distinct product suites, you know, global surface water extent from um, optical and SAR data, the global land surface disturbance and change detection from optical data, and then the land surface deformation for North America uh, from uh, SAR data. Uh, so after the product formulation was completed, the OPERA project was established to design, implement, and produce these uh, product suites. And the OPERA uh, project science team leadership in particular includes David Beckert as the project manager, and then Stephen Chan and Alexander Handwerger as a project scientist and deputy project scientist, respectively. And uh, I'll detail some of these uh, uh, very briefly, these uh, upcoming individual products. Again, I emphasize that they're upcoming. So the first one is the Near Global Dynamic Surface Water Extent, or DSWEX for short. It's a product suite consisting of these three aforementioned products. Uh, the first pro uh, product out of them is, is uh, harmonized, uh, harmonized Landsat and Sentinel-2 optical uh, product, or HLS for short. Uh, the second one is Sentinel-1A and B radar product. And then there's finally, uh, it's rounded out by the NISAR L-band radar product. And the second product suite is Near Global Lens uh, Disturbance product. It's comprised of two products, an alert product for a disturbance, as well as an annual uh, summary product. And again, here we are leveraging this HLS data as an input source, um, so optical data. And then uh, we have the North America displacement product, which is a radar product, and it will be geocoded line of sight displacement product from Sentinel 1A and B, as well as NISAR. And then finally, there are these intermediate set of products, which will be used for generating these higher level products, but uh, they're very useful in their own right, as well as for the community. So they will be distributed separately from the associated higher level products as well. Specifically, there are two such product suites, the co-registered um, um, SLC, the CSLC stack product from Sentinel-1AB, as well as NISAR, and then the radio terrain corrected or RPC product from Sentinel-1AB. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, on the right, you will see the Opera Project plus partner logos. Um, uh, we are working together with these university partners, as well as other federal agencies. And please take a look at the link here for uh, more detailed materials and documents concerning these products, timeline of availability, and you'll also find some sample products in some cases and some accompanying visual, uh, visual guides on how to view them for some select case studies. 
And uh, just a couple more slides here, because I think it's as appropriate time as any to, um, given in the context of the ARIA Center Interferometric Product, it's appropriate time as any to provide sort of an overview of OPERA's sort of counterpart upcoming aforementioned surface displacement product suite. So the displacement product is going to be a frame-based product, and the frames are going to be fixed in time, which is unlike the ESA frames, which occasionally shift. So the OPERA displacement frames will be produced for the same spatial area or, or, or footprint and will ensure for easier time series analysis. And the spacing of these products will be 30 meters and the measurement of displacement is going to be in the radar line of sight. And um, um, just to round this out, the displacement values which we'll be getting from these products will be relative in two ways, as you can see denoted on the left. It will be relative in space such that each frame has its local, uh, his own, its own local reference point, as denoted in yellow. In other words, all the pixels of displacement are relative to the spatial reference point, and it'll be also relative in time, such that the displacement value will be cumulative displacement from that reference time. So that means when you uh, were to download a stack of displacement products in the future, uh, you could get at one pixel a time series that looked like what we have on the right, such that. Um, you can see how the ground is displacement over time relative to the given reference point. And um, you know, with that, this is uh, where I'll segue into the um, sort of course material itself, the tutorial material itself. But um, is there any sort of questions about the material I've presented up to this point? If not, I'll move uh, along ahead in the interest of time. So um, before I delve into the ARIA tools notebooks themselves, let me show you how to manually visualize and access ARIA products to the ASF Vertex page, uh, which is the website um, through which you may access products stored on the ASF DAC. So to get started, you'd first log in by signing in the upper right. I already went ahead and did that. And then you'd filter the appropriate data set um, name, which is ARIA S1W uh, from this uh, data set drop down menu. I'm pretty conservative about playing around with it right now because I don't want it to glitch or freeze. But um, anyway, the first thing you're going to notice is that it says we have apparently 5.8 million products. That's a number that we not only aspire for, but we hope to blow out the water. But honestly not what we have right now at hand when it comes to the archive of ARIA products. So what exactly is going on? Well, what's going on is if you take a closer look at the filters option next to the search window, um, and then you go under file type, there's several options. You should click the standard product net CDF because if you don't, it's gonna give the duplicated results for each of the embedded full resolution layers. And you see that we only have 1.1 million products at this time, but uh, um, you know that's a number that, um, like I said, we're very proud of um, that we were able to get to this level in a short amount of time. But um, again, that, that's something you have to be very careful of um, uh, to keep in mind um, as you go along um, and to look at um, this listed counts. But um, yeah, so with that said, in terms of querying the products themselves. Again, I'm, I'm gonna be very careful about uh, drawing the product cut line, um, but it's very intuitive. It's sort of just click, drag and drop over a given area of interest. I clicked over Hawaii um, because that's gonna be the focus for the first ARIA extract notebook. And uh, you go ahead and filter that way. You're gonna see that there's 414 products at least through 2018 and it's showing the first 250 products by default. So if you want to see all of them, you have to manually toggle that cap as so by clicking on the uh, carrot there. Um, but the idea is generally you could uh, go through these uh, individual product frames um, and get some information on the scene details, specifically this reference start stop time, the path number, which is going to be important from molecules perspective, like direction, so on and so forth. Um, but then uh, you, you can even go ahead and download the products if you want as well directly from here without any other external software. But if you were to proceed on your own, you'd have to keep in mind you'd need to manage the standard products on your own end. 
In other words, you need to code up a way to extract the layers you want, crop them, mask them how you want, access the geometry information, stitch your frames from getting acquisition where necessary. And if you want to perform time series analysis, you'd have to figure out a way to sort of package that in a way that could be easily digestible into um, Mint's PY. Fortunately, you don't have to do this. So this uh, it's not going to be anyone's thesis effort. Our team already went down this road for you. And that's where ARIA Tools comes into play. So um, ARIA Tools, you could refer to the GitHub page for some more background. But as a quick synopsis, ARIA Tools is a suite of open source tools which automate the post-processing manipulation and management of a collection of standard INSAR products for a given study region up through the production of time series. So products such as DM models, water mass, qualitative figures and metrics such as perpendicular baselines and spatial extents of product frames um, that are efficiently downloaded or produced. Um, and they're also organized through an accessible command line interface. So these tools again are developed and maintained and contributed to by people with us today, such as again, Brett Marin, Yunjin, Eric Fielding, and others of course, such as David Beckert and Robert Zinke. And uh, sort of as a complement to the ARIA tools docs, uh, or to, I should say through ARIA tools is the ARIA tools docs, where you have documented separate scenarios for each of the tools in a series of dedicated aptly named notebooks, which are named for their respective uh, scripts. And that's gonna be found under the Jupyter docs subdirectory that I've opened up here. And uh, there's sort of these six distinct ARIA tool programs that they are outlining some case studies for. Some are gonna be more self-explanatory to others, but I'll just briefly summarize them all now. So ARIA download is used to query and download standard products physically or virtually. ARIA plot is used to generate some basic qualitative plots of metrics such as perpendicular baselines or average coherence history. ARIA extract is used to extract specified layers. ARIA TS setup is used to extract and prepare all the required layers for time series analysis through mid PY. So you could think of it as essentially beat the comprehensive version of ARIA extract. And then there are a couple of supplemental tools. You have ARIA AOI assist, which is used to create shapefiles for new study areas in a way that is compatible for direct deployment through ARIA and also high pipelines. And then ARIA misclosure, which is used to calculate phase misclosure, which is uh, then used to assess the quality of an interferometric time series stack. The notebook outlines a nice and basic description behind what phase misclosure is as well. But it's also something to understand Haresh went into in some detail in the previous talk. But um, um, this is some application within the framework of ARIA um, products itself, though. But uh, for this particular tutorial, we're gonna go over a couple of variants of two select notebooks, ARIA Extract and RTS Setup. You are to run both to completion independently for your homework, but you're of course welcome to go over with um, the, the, through the others on your own time as you wish and direct your questions um, anytime. But um, with that, I'm going to do a transition into the actual notebooks themselves finally, but um, again, please feel free to interject with any questions and concerns. Um, but yeah, with that, let's jump right into it. I'm gonna go start off with ARIA Extract and then ARIA TS Setup. ARIA TS Setup is gonna be pretty quick because it's essentially a wrapper around ARIA Extract. But um, um, with that said, um, ARIA Extract uh, Notebook is perhaps the most comprehensive crash course of all of ARIA tools in terms of level of detail for all of the various options. So. To find it, you just enter the geosync folder uh, in your home directory, then go into EarthScope 2023, and then finally 3.3 into program stacks with ARIA tools. And this is going to be the directory which contains the two notebooks we'll need uh, and will be running. So with ARIA extract, when you open that up, you just double click it. You got to specify their EarthScope kernel as so, uh, uh, like that. And if you don't do that, it's not a matter of if. It's not even a matter of when program will just crash in like the first cell. So you need to make sure to do that for both of the notebooks. So um, again, like I said, these notebooks are to be completed for homework. So feel free to go at your own pace. Uh, there may not be enough time to finish up anything, everything at this session end to end per se, especially for the more time consuming RETS setup part, but it doesn't hurt to at least play around with it um, and gain some familiarity with it as you follow along. I've already ran through all these notebooks a priori, again, because I'm paranoid about 
issues of crashing or so on, on my end at least. But um, yeah, um, anyway, in essence, the ARI extract function allows users to extract the layers they want and modify them as needed. That's it in a nutshell. So with that, uh, in this particular notebook, we'll be taking a look at the product spanning the start of the 2018 Hawaii rifting event. So the first part is the uh, workspace prep and the prep A cell. It's recommended to use the stage data stored on the public S3 bucket to save just a little bit of time in querying and downloading the products and to avoid. So in other words, you don't have to use ARIA downloads per se. We already have the products downloaded up front. And in addition to this part, the working directory and corresponding variables are initiated and passed through here. So if you fail to run this part, the notebook would, would again fail to work. And then um, that's it. I already went ahead and run it. In the next cell, you'll be prompted to enter your Earth data credentials if your NetRC file doesn't exist. And this is what's needed to successfully run ARIA downloads if you didn't have the stage data prepared. I know you all have already done so, but in the likely event you haven't, take this opportunity to discreetly create your Earth data account via the listed link and take care of that NetRC file now um, before it's not too late. And, um, yeah, and then the next cell, um, it's uh, prepped to uh, initiate this simple plotting function that allows us, us to visualize our outputs later on the fly. Okay, and then jumping into the final stage of the prep, it's the ARIA download part, which we use to download the data. Assuming again, we hadn't already downloaded the stage data. If we had, then the dummy check prevents us from duplicating efforts. So um, what's going on here? Um, I'll take the, here the opportunity to briefly describe ARIA download. First and foremost, um, it's crucial to have two things specified when querying the catalog with ARIA download. One, um, you have to pass for the T flag a valid argument for a path or track number that you can determine from initial lookup via the ASF Vertex website, as I showed. So for this select case, it's ascending track 124. You don't have to specify ascending or descending geometry. You can, but by default, it just searches for that given uh, track ID. Um, and then the next thing you need to specify is a spatial footprint with the B flag. Now, you could provide that as a list of four numbers corresponding to a south, northwest, east bounding box, which is a familiar convention as an ICE, or as an input shape file. But if I didn't make it blatantly obvious, I clearly didn't take my own advice here as I neglected to specify an argument for the B flag. So, you know, why is that such a big deal? Why am I emphasizing that? Well, that's because track numbers aren't exclusive necessarily to a given area. And a given area isn't exclusive to a single track. So for this particular case, we actually had track 20, 124 products over the Aleutian Islands, which I'd imagine would be rather challenging to stitch vis-a-vis -vis the Hawaiian Track 124 products. So what was sort of my saving grace here? Why didn't the notebook crash later? Well, I specified the download of a specific IFG with the IFG flag here. Uh, and this just turns out to be exclusive to Hawaii. So I just got lucky. And uh, you know, with that said, please exercise caution by always specifying both a track and path number with the T flag and then a spatial footprint with the B flag. And if you want more detailed conference and description and all the useful options and functions, I direct you to the dedicated ARIA downloads notebook under the ARIA tools docs page. So yeah, let's start to dissect ARIA extract itself. So don't be too intimidated by this um, sort of big wall of uh, options, so to say, when running help. You know, it's just ARIA extract help. That's how you end up getting all this information. But uh, you know, don't be intimidated, but rather be encouraged. These suite of options translate to a good amount of flexibility and freedom to manage and manipulate your products all in-house via ARIA tools. So we'll go over the major options in more detail through the notebook with some accompanying visuals, but please feel free to refer to the help as a comprehensive list and guide of options. So um, the first and foremost, um, most fundamental option is to specify your input file or files with the F flag. And uh, by default, ARIA download deposits your products inside of a subdirectory named products, which is inside of your working directory. So you may provide the relative path to a, to a specific file or a subset of files by 
pasting them in a common delisted list, as you see here in the notebook. That's only if you're interested, let's say, on a subset. Usually, you, you want to extract all uh, the layers from all of your downloaded products. So in that case, just specify a wildcard, just the uh, relative path that's so it's under your product subdirectory, let's say, and then you hit a star like that, and then you extract the layers from all of your downloaded products. I'd advise if you want to play around with subsets of data, yeah, you can go ahead and manually specify them as so, but it's very painstaking. I, I would just um, suggest to have a separate working directory for subsets if that's what you want to do. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the next option, um, you could specify which layer or layers you want to extract with the L option. You could specify any single layer or combination of layers you want referring again to the help output above to see a comprehensive list of all uh, available layers. See, you know, like unwrap phase, coherence, amplitude, all that, all the valid layers that you could access are listed there for you to specify. Or you could also just opt to extract all available layers by passing all as an argument. If you don't specify any layer, then the program will simply extract shapefiles delineating product extents. More on that shortly. And then Aria TS setup, um, for the layers by default, it passes the minimum requirements expected for time series analysis, like the unwrapped phase, the connected components, the perpendicular baselines, just the minimum working requirements needed for that time series analysis. So that's sort of the distinction between the RETS setup and RETS RET setup, in a sense, has like a hard coded layers op suite of options, but you could also uh, pass additional layers if you wish. But again, I'm kind of jumping ahead there. Um, that's going to come shortly. And then uh, rounding out the next two options here, I'll revisit these shortly in more detail, but to suffice to say, if you wish to download and clip a DM and or mask to your study area, you just pass download as arguments respectively to the D and M masks. Or alternatively, if you already have downloaded a priori DMs or models, just pass the relevant paths to them as arguments instead to the respective flags. Okay, and now on to um, uh, the suite of cropping and spatial subsetting options. So at first glance and read through, they honestly sound a bit complicated, but really they're very simple and incredibly useful tools that are at, sort of at the heart of RE tools, so to say. But first I'm gonna jump ahead just a bit. And um, this is uh, because this is appropriate time as any to discuss stitching. So for a given pair, there may be multiple spatially continuous product frames that would need to be stitched so as to have a complete full seam. When stitching product layers at each frame along a track, some of the layers like amplitude and coherence involve a straightforward trivial blending, which is executed by relatively minimal GDO commands internally in ARIA tools that you don't have to worry about messing around manually. However, stitching of unwrapped phase fields is much more complex and complicated to perform especially outside of ARIA tools, as that instead involves estimating and minimizing discontinuities uh, across frame boundaries that are some multiple of two pi. So this is just to put into context that we are accessing the extents of full scenes, which may include multiple frames when cropping and subsetting data through ARIA tools. Okay, so now I could sort of, that little bit of context, I could jump back just a bit. Um, yeah, back to this cropping and spatial subsetting section. So th this is where I'm going to start going into the specific um, subsetting options at play. So by default, if a user specifies nothing and does not input a spatial extent, then the program simply defines a common cut line based off the common intersection uh, of all acquisitions, as illustrated by this magenta line in this uh, figure uh, two um, on the left. So this cut line is then applied to all acquisitions such that all layers share a common spatial coverage. And then note that in, in these simple 2D figures, um, we're just plotting the north-south axis of the layers, which roughly reflects its azimuth direction. So we have a simplified visual of exactly how these scenes are cropped with respect to their common intersection. And uh, alternatively, users may override this behavior with this crop to union option you know, right here, you can pass on the command line and instead have ARIA tools compute the common union of all intergrams and clip all the scenes to these bounds, which is the sort of more liberal uh, range of, uh, illustrated by the yellow line in the right figure in a way that no data is cropped out. 
So this means that relatively shorter scenes like that on the far right will be modified to have a great deal of empty space because they don't span great distances. Now, this option is not recommended if you wish to proceed with time series analysis because clearly you cannot ensure complete consistent uh, coverage in time for all pixels. And then uh, on to the next step here, um, we may have probably one of the more familiar options from an ice perspective, the bounding box option or the B option. So with this, like with ice, you may specify the extent as a rectangular bounding box. So south, north, west, east, or lat, lat, long, long coordinates respectively. Alternatively, and what generally myself and other colleagues do is to create a predefined custom shape file that can have whatever shape you want or need. Um, in other words, it doesn't have to be a basic box. It can be whatever you want, like it's illustrated on the right of the figure three. Now you could create a box as a simple shape file or GeoJSON and pass it as an argument for B instead. Um, so you can clip it however way you want. And then finally, in this family of subsetting options, we have this crucial minimum overlap option. So for some context, we had this recurring annoying issue for larger study areas where we're processing products across continental scales where there may be upwards of 10 frames per track, let's say. And uh, there are some outlier short pairs with a, a few frames which skew the common track intersection uh, by, that all products by default are cropped to in a way that isn't necessarily intended. So you can see this uh, magenta line of common intersection of products uh, in the figure to the left, which doesn't align, it turns out, with the, the desired user specified bounding box denoted by the dashed blue lines. So where this MO, this minimum overlap option comes into play is that it helps you kick out these short acquisitions, it sort of serves as a bouncer, so to say. So um, the way it works is by enforcing a specified area overlap in square kilometers with respect to your specified input bounding box that you pass through um, B uh, as an argument for B again. So with this enforced MO of a thousand in figure uh, on figure four on the right, you can see that the one scene in the middle um, that doesn't satisfy this level of coverage respect to the defined bounding box in blue is rejected. So clearly this option is contingent on a user defined input for the bounding box. Otherwise you have no area of interest to base your criteria on. So one easy way uh, to define a bounding box in this scenario is to either draw a cut line around the extent of the scene you see represented it either manually or on your own through QGIS or Google Earth or more, much more easily by simply running ARIA extracted initial time with no argument and copying over the extracted product bounding box for the particular scene that you deem representative, like let's say the acquisition on the far right of uh, figure four here. And I'll show you shortly how to access that cut line and how to pass it. Um, but with that all said, going forward with production efforts to hype, we have developed a procedure to ensure all products slated for production cover an entire given area of interest. And we try to avoid processing cases that don't. So that's to say, this is a problem that should only affect legacy efforts and not ongoing processing efforts. Um, and then, um, yeah, as far as that goes, um, there's a couple more options here. The work directory option or W is a straightforward way for you to specify a path to a directory within which you wish to deposit all outputs of ARIA tools. So this is highly recommended as the default deposits a series of output directories within the local working directory where you launch the scripts, which could get quick, which could get quickly messy as I'll show shortly. And then uh, our final option um, is this output format, the O option. Um, and it's uh, this key option to sort of define the output format of your extracted rasters. By default, if manipulation is needed, then an NV format is produced. And if not, then a virtual VRT pointer is generated to conserve space. But you could choose whatever other GDAL supported format you want, such as GeoTIFF or even the familiar ICE format. Okay. And then before we jump into the couple of basic examples, let me round out these options with an overview of some of the basic RE extract methods. So I've already touched upon a lot of this earlier. So I'll skip over some details and we'll go over highlights here. So as far as uh, extraction of layers without manipulation goes, 
ARIA tools parses through products and groups them into spatially, temporally, contiguous scenes corresponding to a given pair, and you know, if there's more than one frame per se. I already talked about how this process is more straightforward for simple amplitude and coherence layers, which are stitched by averaging the overlapping areas just fine. But the unwrapped base fields are stitched through more complex means by minimizing the two pi jumps between the different connected components that overlap along the frame boundaries. Um, so that though that's they're physically extracted in that sense by default even. Um, but you could again override this behavior if you really want to extract everything physically by passing that in, in the OF flag as a non-default non-BRT option. Um, but yeah, so let me. I think now I should go into more details on how the metadata layers are extracted. So the method of extracting geometry layers, these are the metadata layers. Um, such as perpendicular baselines, incidence angles, and azimuth angles is a bit more complex compared to the other standard inframetric layers. That's because the geometry layers have been downsampled to roughly a 10 kilometer posting and discrete height levels of three kilometer increments as sort of illustrated here by the dash dots. And that's how they're embedded. They're embedded as coarse cubes in the products. Um, and uh, this is possible as these layers smoothly vary spatially anyways, and downsampling would help to significantly reduce file sizes and thus help with portability and storage costs. And we'll demonstrate how these layers can easily and reliably be interpolated accurately through ARIA tools. Specifically, this resampling and conversion for a coarse cube to a standard 2D raster of the same resolution of the extracted unwrapped face field involves interpolation and intersections with the heights in the full resolution uh, DM file as sort of denoted by the cartoon volcano here, this intersection with the height layers and this interpolation um, and in the vertical axis to and 2D axis to sort of derive um, this full resolution layer uh, in, the, in terms of the geometry layers. So yeah, um, now is the time I'm gonna just uh, kind of go through the examples, but uh, before I do, please feel free to um, voice any questions or concerns. Okay, so in our first example, if we can see if we run ARIA extract with no other arguments other than the input products themselves with the F flag, then the program simply computes and creates shape files recording the spatial extents of each into program and deposits them inside of this product bounding box subdirectory. So we have two frames here. Um, that correspond to the same time. So they're stitched into a single uh, IFG cut line, and that's what's according to generated this pair.geojson. Additionally, also generated are two general product bounding boxes corresponding to the common scene union, this product bounding box prop to union for metadata layer, and then, uh, and then the common scene intersection itself, which is uh, denoted by the product bounding box .geojson respectively. Um, here, we only have one scene, so these cut lines are all identical, and uh, you can see it uh, you know, visualized here below. But in cases where you have multiple scenes, um, by default, all rasters will be cropped to this common track intersection. So if you wish to instead to clip them to the bounds delineated by the common union, you'd have to pass, again, crop to union in the command line. And then also... Uh, Again, in regards to that minimum overlap option earlier, if like there's this one scene that you think is representative in a stack that you want to enforce the extents to, um, I, what I would do, like let's say it's this pair and there's like several others, I would take this cut line in this initial run, pass it as an argument for B, and then the MO value itself um, would be sort of, I would just to be conservative, 90% of the area of that cut line. And to get the area of the cut line, yeah, you could do that manually, but there's a simple command you could use through GDAL, it's over, uh, OGR to info to get that area itself. And so it's like just a couple lines there. And I, I could communicate that as need be. Um, but yeah, so as far as our second example goes, we're gonna start extracting product layers and experimenting more with products simultaneously. Um, but, uh, so we're going to start off by taking some baby steps and extract uh, the first the amplitude layer itself without messing around with the cut lines of the product bounding box quite yet. 
So and because of that, so I specified amplitude as an argument for um, L. I'm going to skip over the output product bounding box. So what you could see is that you have this output subdirectory called amplitude within which these uh, products are deposited. So why are there two different files for one pair? Well, that's because there's this original and aptly named uncrop version, pair underscore uncrop BRT. And then the final crop version to which the common intersection product bounding box cut line was applied, which is pair.brt. So it's of course this latter final project, which is made visible and pushed through for time series analysis via RITS setup. And note that both of these files are virtual, they're VRT pointer files. And that's because this is the default behavior for files for which there was no specified modification. Again, unless you wish to specify another GDAL format and physically extract them uh, with the OF flag, you just specify any non-VRT option there. But by default, this is not done intentionally to preserve space because these are essentially just text files. They're not physical rasters if they're extracted that way. And uh, here we could finally visualize the amplitude layer itself. Recall again, the significance of the amplitude layer, which serves as a record of backscatter, which itself is a proxy for the complexity of the surface or strength of the signal. So rougher surfaces with strong returns, such as exposed stable bedrock will appear bright, while smoother flat surfaces are very complex surfaces, such as uh, tall vegetation obscure signals, such that there's low return. Okay, so in the next part, um, in addition to extracting the coherence this time, by specifying that as an argument for the L flag, we have specified a smaller bounding box with the B box argument. So that's why it's no surprise the resulting shape file looks a bit different. It's like a box now. So um, now um, we can take a look at also the coherence file, which is extracted and deposited into the aptly named coherence subfolder. And it's no surprise that it's clipped to the smaller bounds uh, that we've specified, which is tighter around uh, the island of Hawaii. So you know, what's the significance of the coherence file here? So coherence itself is a qualitative measure of interferometric correlation. It ranges from zero, where there's no useful information in the program, to one, where there is theoretically no noise in the program. So it's a theory of perfect pixel, as much as I hesitate uh, to say that. And then um, in the next, uh, just moving along in the interest of time, um, just keeping up with the general theme of this section, Let's extract the new type of layer here. Finally, or first look at this uh, uh, metadata layer, the geometry file. I use those two terms interchangeably. In this case, it's the incidence angle file. And I'm going to showcase some more um, flexibility and leveraging shape files. This time we had a, a shape file prepared a priori, which is sort of delineating a cut line along the big island itself. So it's a literal cookie cutter. Everything outside of this clip zone is going to be masked out, as you'll see shortly, uh, well, right here. But just to show again, this incidence angle is extracted as so within this aptly named subdirectory. It's not just a BRT pointer file because we have to physically extract and prepare a physical raster. And recall again that we need a DEM in order to extract this layer, in order to intersect it with the point of reference. So in, in uh, vertical and uh, horizontal resolution. So that's why I specified the download of a DM. Alternatively, if you had an existing DM that was valid over this given area, you could pass the uh, a priori downloaded path as well as an argument, but I didn't have one. So I just downloaded it from scratch here. And then, um, yeah, as far as the incidence angle file, see everything outside of the big island is masked out. And just note how um, it's very smooth and clean, the field. So this sort of demonstrates reliability of this interpolation method. Okay, so then we're gonna go to jump um, into the mask. So uh, final two examples here. So um, this uh, in this example, um, we're gonna be past specifying the download of a mask with the download flag and uh, applying that to unwrapped phase field here. And it's very useful to have this availability of masks because we may not always have these convenient shape files at our disposal to clip oceans and other water bodies out of our products, or it may not be the best use of time to create that or to even search for that. 
However, you know, with ARIA tools, you could easily download this mask from the GSHH database, which for those of you that are familiar with is the source used by the uh, GMT software for delineating water bodies. And this is the default mask that's downloaded when you specify the download as an argument for M. However, alternatively, you may instead access a water mask from another source, specifically the NLCD managed by USGS by simply specifying NLCD as an argument for M instead. Anyways, the result is pretty straightforward. As you'd expect, you get a binary output with one denoting land and zero denoting water. So clearly the oceans are captured well here. And in the next panel, you'll see that the oceans in the unwrapped phase field are also taken care of. And this is our sort of first look at the unwrapped phase field itself. Um, I'm gonna come back to that as well. Um, but um, that's when I round off with the DEM. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the background behind that since I've already covered it, but suffice to say here, we're specifically downloading Copernicus DM sampled at 90 meter resolution, hence their official name, Copernicus Glow 90 DM, and default output name, Glow 90, um, as, as shown here. And it's deposited under an aptly named subdirectory called DM. And just like you'd expect in the output layer when we visualize, um, we see these sort of high elevations along the summits of the Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea volcanoes, and then we get close to sea level, you know, towards the sea. So it's that simple. Um, yeah, and I'm going to end off uh, the ARIA extract notebook on just a couple of examples, uh, well, a couple applications, I should say, uh, that are of relevance for more involved modeling and analysis efforts, starting off with the derivation of the east-north up conversion factors you'd need for modeling. So the unwrapped phase fields we've seen illustrates deformation in a satellite's line of sight. So if we want to, you know, translate modeling outputs um, from the standard east-north up directions into the line of sight, we could, as we could directly compare with its observations, then we need to leverage some simple trig involving the geometry files, um, the geometry equations, I should say here, um, the geometry files, and then the trig equations outlined here to Sam, derive these sport factors. I yeah. think it's helpful at this point to point out what the sign convention is for ARIA standard product interferograms, because I've been hammering on that point that not everybody uses the same sign convention for what is up and what is down. Yeah, yeah. So then in this case, um, kind of blanking, the sign convention, it's, it's going to be sort of positive for uplift. So that's sort of what I'm jumping out to here. So essentially in this context, right, uh, just to illustrate it, we see this discrete zone of subsidence, which turns out corresponds to deformation resulting from magma withdrawal out and away from the Kilauea Rift Zone into the east. So here it's negative, and that's where it's uh, subsidence because it, it's positive corresponds to sort of uplift. Is so that... it's the opposite of range change, basically. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I, I always get this confused too, that TS could um, correct me, but the reference scene um, itself, that's later in time. Right, guys? Right, Marin and Brett? I think, yeah. So I, th I think it is, yes. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's okay. the intention. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit opposite. But then that's the thing. that This is what's managed internally within Mint's PY. It references everything to a standard convention. So... When you go ahead and look at the time series and the velocity fields, you don't have to worry about this internal mental math. But yeah, if you're if you're gonna go ahead and visualize the outputs like I'm doing here, just directly from our uh, um, tools, then you need to keep in mind that sign convention, like Gareth mentioned. Does that help? No. Yeah. So um, yeah, so. Essentially, in order to do that projection that's outlined here in the first application, we already have prepared this simple Python blurb to go ahead and uh, sort of derive those scaling factors. And that's populated inside of this result subdirectory. And uh, just to quickly go over that here, um, the, note that the, these kind of correspond to their relative levels of sensitivity are in SAR measurements half to certain directions because they are scaling factors. So for the values in up, our vertical scaling factors, they're high. So that means INSAR is especially sensitive to the vertical direction. This is because the angle of observation with respect to the ground is pretty steep. 
and other hand, um, NSAR is relatively insensitive to the northern direction, uh, given the low values for the scaling factor, um, as you can see here. So um, that this is because it's more in line with the flight path of the satellite and thus not well resolved with its line of sight. And on the contrary, uh, the sensitivity to the east direction is high as the line of sight is well aligned, given again, the satellite's roughly a north-south flight path, which is more in line with the east-west direction. And um, yeah, for the last application, I kind of touched upon that um, just a moment ago, but uh, the idea here is that uh, we have a simple procedure to convert the um, unwrapped interferogram, which is distributed in radian units, to a more easily digestible unit of centimeters. So we do this by taking into note the conversion involves multiplying the raw phase with a factor that consists of a uh, the sensor wavelength, which for Sentinel-1 is, is 5.54 centimeters divided by 4 pi. And this is accomplished by a simple uh, little independent GDAL script that I you could use called GDAL calc. You could pass the you know, equation logic here, which is, again, this equation in the kind of GDAL recognizable form. And then uh, what I was showing there is a scaled output in centimeters. I didn't flip the sign here. Um, you see there's no negative. So this is, that, that's sort of, again, the sign convention I was getting at, um, where positive is for uplift, um, positive towards the satellite. Um, so whether it's uplift or uh, horizontal motion towards the satellite, and then vice versa for negative. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it for the RU track notebook. I'm just going to need like 10 minutes for RUT as setup. I kind of gave some spoilers there anyway, but um, before, well, I'll just um, change over to there. But is there any sort of questions or concerns of other concerns about RU extract? If not, we could also go over it at the end. Okay, so let's just end up on the RUT as setup. Um, again, I keep on emphasizing it's essentially beefed up version of RE Extract. Essentially, it's a wrapper script, so it shares the same options and much of the same functionality. The only difference is, again, it uh, maintains this prerequisite requirements for time series analysis for mint PY. And the requirements specifically include the extraction of, well, namely the unwrapped phase field and also the coherence. Well, the connected components, imaging geometry layers, such as azimuth, incidence angle, and look angle, and also the uh, perpendicular baseline. So for this case, we're going to be looking at a mini uh, stack over the San Francisco Bay Area. So a lot of the same prep. We have the stage data ready to go, but uh, here's the ARIA download command to go ahead and uh, access it um, independently. Um, if you wish, and I only did it for year 2019, just in the interest of time. Um, but you can go ahead and look at the full archive if you wish. And what I mean by the interest of time is that I tested out on the entire available time span for roughly the past seven years. And it took like, a, I think like three, four hours. And uh, that's admittedly not with the best internet, but you know, call me an optimist or uh, call me biased, but I would think that even taking three hours to process seven years of data across multiple frames is, is still encouraging, though, since it's a fraction of the time it takes in running from scratch everything. In other words, downloading SLCs and forming into programs. But you know, with that said, the team, um, you know, Marin, is working to optimize the um, efficiency and speed of um, even this uh, extraction method with DASC methods. So that's something which we hope to uh, also share um, um, sometime soon. Um, a lot of tests are still to be done. But um, anyway, the help is pretty much the same as RX track, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, you know, all of that stuff, it's, it's um, meant to be standalone, but it's all kind of from the RX track notebook. So I'm going to just jump into um, the step in creating the stack. Um, note, you don't need to specify, again, the extraction of any layers because by default, the minimum required layers are extracted. But if you want to extract the non-default not needed amplitude layer, for instance, that's not done by default, then you need to specify with the output layer uh, argument for L, so L amplitude, and it will extract it along with the other layers. And again, since the geometry 
files are extracted by the program, you'd need to either specify path to an existing DM or specify its download with the download flag. And finally, since there's going to be a lot of water in the Bay Area, you know, it's advised that you, of course, use a mask so you go ahead and download it all in-house again. So I'm going to skip over some of the basic displays here and sort of jump to the important final aspect of ARIA-TS setup to note, which is the generation of this stack directory, which contains these three distinct VRT files. These VRT files are called coast, uh, coherent stack, connected component stack, and unwrapped stack, respectively. And they contain the coherence, connected component, and wrap base layers projected uh, info into sequential order. So these serve as a clean record, which is directly read off of by Mint PY in the next phase of time series analysis. So when you see these VRTs, think of them as sort of a baton in the last leg of the race, or I, I should say at this rate, more of a marathon. But um, yeah, and then just to end off a little visual, you could even uh, manipulate the VRTs to iteratively uh, visualize um, each of the embedded layers. So this is, I just put the first pair, which is from early 2019. So it's not a close seismic pair. There's not any significant deformation going on. So it's really difficult to de deduce or interpret any deformation here. Um, and there's you know, some great deal of noise, but you know that's where time series analysis comes into play. It could better help to articulate a longer term record of deformation and average out to uh, some transient noise. So, um, you know, that's the end of the notebooks I'll be demoing. So, um, uh, before I give the open up the floor to general questions and discussions, please let me know if you have any specific questions regarding the ARIA TS setup notebook. Well, um, if not, then you can go ahead and open the floor to general discussion and question session. And uh, looks like the chat and QA is pretty active. So, yeah, I see in the QA, um, Amrit said that uh, I used this, but I didn't. There's more. Sorry, um, could you clarify your question? Um, not sure I understand. So I yeah, yeah, I can do it. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Hello. Yeah, so yeah, I was uh, trying to download the annual interferograms for specific years. Mm -hmm. And then when I do that, it downloads. I, I don't know how it considered the, the time span. I could get some result, but yeah, it, it does not consider the year that I specified. So... The, yeah, for example, I, I would like to down, download the annual interferogram for, for a specific year, say 2016 and 17. But when I do it, it, it downloads the data, but it does not consider the year that I specified. So what does it just download all pairs or pairs that uh, are beyond? Yeah, all, all pairs with a temporal baseline more than, uh, more than 364 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe if you could uh, provide a list, what I think may be going on, if I'm not mistaken, is maybe it's taking some of these longer pairs, which are beyond a, even annual. So they, they maybe uh, have like a reference date, which is within that time period, but then the secondary scene falls outside of that time span, right? Maybe the, the yeah. primary date is uh, 2016 something, but then the secondary scene falls into 2015 or 14 are you know same thing for 2019 well the 2019 and the reference if reference date is one thing it should go backward um you shouldn't get anything outside uh on, i should say more recent than 2019 mm -hmm. if you do then i have to i think that's a bug i have to look into that but i wouldn't be surprised if you're getting results which are before 2016 just because the reference date of 2016 may be linked up to earlier dates is that sort of what you're saying yeah, yeah, I will give one more try and then, yeah, you can put in slag or, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so, um, yeah, please do let me know. Looks like the team is active in the chat, but is there any specific thing I should address here? Um, let me know. 
I'm just looking at it on my own there now. Um, let's see. Any more questions for Sim? Of course, we have the, the Slack. Yeah. There's a question for you um, in the in the chat, Sim. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's OK. Also, I didn't quite get what the connection between extract and setup is. Yeah. So ARIA extract essentially is uh, sort of the base of ARIA TS setup. ARIA extract is where you're able to just extract specific individual layers. And it doesn't necessarily um, produce the necessary output files that you need for time series analysis for mint py it doesn't produce this prep stack or so aria uh, ts setup is sort of this uh a wrapper around aria extract which makes sure to extract not only the minimum required um files like the unwrapped base build connected component incidence angle and so but then creates this sort of stack drt files right this stack um um yeah, it's, it's this large um, kind of window text here that that is what's needed by Mint PY. So it's sort of like a Mint PY interface in a sense. Kind of said a lot there, but does that sort of make sense? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, any other questions or so? Again, thanks uh, to the team for helping uh, in the chat oh where okay another question here uh where can i specify the dates to create a time series um hmm. so i think um as far as specifying discrete dates that's something that could be done through mint py but in aria tools um you could specify uh distinct pairs process but not necessarily dates um so the idea is that you download everything within a given window and then if you want to sort of down select based off of just specific dates themselves you could do that through a um, mint py but you know still that's a good point to raise that's something that um, we could work to sort of integrate into our tools as well up front so to save a little bit of time but that's not directly supported through our tools Any more, any more questions? Because if not, we might uh, let Sim uh, uh, step down. And, and there's basically one more thing to talk about today, which is what the homework is for today. And I will share my screen briefly to show you that. Okay, so here's the syllabus. Um, and so the homeworks for today. Uh, the first one is to use copies of the notebooks from module 3.1. So the first thing we talked about today to model a different earthquake, either uh, using data that we provided or an interferogram you processed yourself. Um, if you click on this link, there are some hints about how to do that. Um, I haven't checked the, the download link, but there, I uploaded an interferogram last year, which hopefully is still in the bucket somewhere that you can access yourself, or you can run um, TOPS app or StripMap app and process something yourself. And the second thing is to complete the TS setup notebook that, that Sim just showed us on your own, run it, complete it, um, and be ready and in a position to run MintPy um, on Friday. Any questions about that? Okay, so can we go for that uh, notebook, the link you just specified for the modeling a different earthquake? Can we? Can, you, want to look, you can just click on it in the syllabus. Yeah, it's no, just... I have it open looking at this, but maybe some extra comment. What would you like to know? Let me just... Uh... Wow, 
what would you like to know? It has two cases. One, if you want to use a pre-processed interferogram, this command will download uh, a zip file containing a different earthquake, a bunch of files. Um, and then you have to put all the paths and things to the to the files correctly in your in your notebook. I'm not going to do that for you. Um, and the other way is if you want to use your own interferogram, you have to make sure that you link the files that you've processed to the right places. Um, and see how far you get. There was a uh, question about the uh, the water mass thing because I think these notes are from last year when last August the the D, the water body download was broken. This year it's been fixed. Water body is one thing, but the water mask script still doesn't work. As far as oh, I know. the water mask script. I don't but know anyway, you don't have from. to use it. You can turn it off. There's a true ah. false flag you can set to not use the water mask and you can use coherence masking, which will get most of the water masked out anyway. So it's probably okay. So um, there is on that, um, the composition there is that use water mask is set for true. So we have to turn this off. Set it to false. Okay. I think it says so in the notebook too. Like, you know, if you have a water mask, you can say yes. And if you don't, say no. Um, there is also, and um, I I don't know if it's 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 working. Uh, I checked and, and, and maybe it was saying the wrong thing. There is a way of actually modeling dikes <laughs> using a very, a version of the same notebook. And if you're interested in that, um, maybe uh, let me know and I'll see if I can find it for you. And if we are, we have no more questions, I think it is time to go we've already overrun a, a bit today um so thanks everyone um we'll see you at office hours at five pacific for those who are interested 7 a.m pacific tomorrow for those who for whom that's a better time and tomorrow we have uh, a day of exciting things including atmosphere corrections uh dense offsets decomposition of line of sight and maybe some things about historic and legacy and current missions it'll be great see you tomorrow bye